After seven previous generations of the Pokemon anime, we have finally arrived at the final generation for Ash's journey, aptly named Pokemon Journeys. These final few seasons for Ash serve as a nice look back and celebration of everything that came before, as we move forward to see Ash not only work toward becoming a Pokemon World Champion, but where we officially leave him at before the newest Pokemon Generation 9 anime brings us all new protagonists to follow. For the Journey series, Ash gets to go on a whole lot of adventures that not only bring bring in familiar faces, but even familiar places, as the world of Pokemon is fully unlocked to explore whenever there is a personal reason for Ash to go there. We get a look into some unanswered questions from Ash's past, even Pikachu's, as we get an Ash at his most adventurous yet, seeking out some challenging fun and going after catching a bunch of Pokemon from all over the regions. Unlike the previous series, the slice of life feeling is toned way back down here to focus on the action adventure side, but that doesn't mean the show won't have some moments that take things slow to focus on some other avenues, sometimes for Ash and sometimes for a new character that we shall meet shortly. There is a lot to go over today and I am excited to go into it all because on top of this new direction that this series will take, it does take cues from the Sword and Shield video games, introducing the new Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing abilities for the Pokemon themselves, tying in further story moments from those games into a section of this anime to at least keep it on brand. Just like how each generation of the franchise serves as a jumping on point for new fans to get into Pokemon, this series is able to be viewed as individual parts and a part of a full multiple video series. So join along as we document how Ash has evolved into who he becomes by the end of it all, venturing down a nostalgia-driven road whether you're a veteran fan or a newcomer to the series. Pokemon Journeys, across every season it has, actually released through Netflix in different bingeable batches, offering a new way to watch the show, and that is in fact how I watched through the Journey series originally. So without waiting any further, we have arrived to the home stretch. Welcome to the complete guide to Ash's Pokemon Journey, Part 8. In the last series, the Sun and Moon era, the anime as a whole took a major pivot from what we would usually see for Pokemon, even more so compared to the XY era right before it, giving us two drastically different styles on the animation side and the tonality side. The Alola region's more chill vibe spread across the multiple forms of media it was in, having the anime be a lot more slice of life as Ash faces no real gym battles to get eight badges. Instead, he takes part in different challenges and island trials that helped him grow his newer Pokemon Pokemon stronger while putting himself into the Pokemon school in that region. At one point, Ash, along with the other students he becomes friends with, all become superheroes essentially, fighting back against these other dimensional beings known as Ultra Beasts, where we get two major moments of action and world saving for the plot, while we then also contrast between very relaxed and toned slice of life character moments, finding some trouble threading this needle between both to find a good pace to operate in. There were some highlight moments in the show from how to grieve and move on after losing a loved one, to having old friends like Brock and Misty appearing a couple times to give longtime fans of the Pokemon anime some very welcome nostalgic feelings. Towards the end of the Sun and Moon series, the Alola region starts their first ever Pokemon League, where, believe it or not, Ash finally wins to become a League Champion, as well as Alola's first ever Champion. From here though, the sights continue to be set higher, as who cares about another League Champion title, it's time to go for the World Champion title, but I'm getting ahead of my Myself. Let's start at the beginning of our journey in Pokemon Journeys. Starting off the series strong, we enter in on Ash's life before all of the adventures with him now being six years old. As this tries to tie back into Professor Oak's summer camp where he met Serena, in which we learned about during the XY series. This younger Ash is excited about this camp, asking his mother to go, as she sees how much he really wants to, and signs him up for it. The deal she makes for doing so is that Ash has to wake himself up in the morning to go. Ash is just too excited about it in general to really listen to what his mother has just told him. Throughout this episode, we start 
start following the journey of this young Pichu in the woods around Palatown. Being young and scared of the world a bit, Pichu ends up nearly falling off a cliff until a Kangaskhan catches the little mouse and she places Pichu in her pouch next to her child, as Pichu would go on continuing to live with the Kangaskhan. After some time has passed and Professor Oak's summer camp has started up, we see him and a group of young campers getting to camp on time while Ash, well, he's still asleep because he broke his alarm clock. Clearly we know this is going to be a pattern for him, but we meet two other campers in the meantime, Go and Chloe, with the day's activities for the camp starting up. Of course, Ash eventually wakes up and starts freaking out over being late, heading out of the house still in his PJs trying to get to Professor Oak's lab. Unfortunately, the group is out and having a good time walking around in nature already, as the professor is helping the campers learn, in a very hands-on way, more about Pokemon and what their futures could be as a Pokemon trainer once they reach 10 years of age. Go starts becoming that one know-it-all kid who tries to show off their knowledge, making himself look cool to the other campers, while Chloe is just annoyed at him, wanting to hear the professor do the teaching, not go. The friendly and sometimes not so friendly bickering between the two causes them to fall behind from the group, with Go exclaiming his plans of looking for a never before seen Pokemon. I mean, how cool would that be, right? The confidence and determination give off Ash vibes already, as he then gets his own spectacular Pokemon sighting, well, his and Chloe's sighting, as they witness Mew having a battle with a Nidoking. Witnessing this in all of Mew's abilities, they see it defeat the Nidoking and decide to follow after it once it begins to head away from there. We see how Mew can hide itself as any other Pokemon, because I've said it before and I'll say it again, Mew's just a little goofball sometimes. Who's that Pokemon? And now, since it's been some time since Pichu was picked up by Kangaskhan, Pichu is having a great life living with Kangaskhan, with the latter coming across the Mew itself, and begins to try and follow it, causing distress for the mother Kangaskhan when she can't find her child. The baby Kangaskhan ends up in trouble though, slipping from these heights it was scaling, now plummeting towards the water below. Mew ends up saving the baby Pokemon and bringing it back to its mother, much to her relief as Mew then flies off. Professor Oak finds Chloe and Go as they explain all that they have seen, with Oak saying that it was most like the Mew that they saw, and that this mythical Pokemon carries within it the genes of every single Pokemon, giving Go the goal of wanting to catch Mew one day, but not in the Team Rocket type of way where they want to use its DNA to create a Mewtwo, so at least there's that. Ash never got to partake in the summer camp that day since he was late, as we see him back at home upset about this, as we now fast forward in time a bit more. First we see Pichu seeing the struggle Kangaskhan goes through to not only take care of its own child, but what it does to take care of the Pichu as well, as he thinks that he should head back out into the world himself, shedding a tear and sneaking away as they are sleeping. Through this love that Pichu felt and gave through being adopted into Kangaskhan's family, the Pichu ends up evolving into a Pikachu, excited to see this when it looks at its reflection in a puddle. We then cut to four years later, as we have the start of the original series replay out, with Ash still having trouble being late, getting to Professor Oak's lab to receive the last Pokemon he could offer to Ash, a Pikachu with us now having learned about his past in the wild and how it evolved from a Pichu in the first place, as now we can jump to present day. We start off once again with Ash sleeping through his alarm as Pikachu wakes up and breaks it for him, but zaps Ash awake as they have to head over to Professor Oak's lab. Oak is packing up a car ready to hit the road to Vermilion City as another professor is setting up a lab there as Ash gets invited along to come see the opening. Ash's mom and Mimi also tag along as they now hit the road. When they arrive, Ash encounters a brand new Pokemon, one that is usually found in the Galar region as this electric pupper known as Yamper is the first thing to greet Ash and Pikachu. We also see Chloe come around walking past Ash to enter the building as she lives there and is just getting back from school. We then get introduced to the new professor for that city now, Professor Cerise, as Chloe receives a text from Go saying that he will be late to the opening and much to her disappointment. Go is busy waiting to see something special based on the weather conditions, pointing to the perfect setup for a legendary Pokemon to appear based on the professor's research and equipment. Apparently, in 20 minutes, a legendary Pokemon will appear with Ash rushing to the harbor, where a crowd of people wait and watch the area for the entrance of something truly special. And right on time, the weather becomes the perfect matching conditions as Lugia emerges onto the scene, with Ash immediately trying to challenge the beast to a battle. And then somehow both Ash and Go jump to make their way onto Lugia's back as it flies around, giving the two trainers an experience they'll 
will soon never forget. After getting some time just taking things in, Go and Ash officially introduce each other to themselves as these two quickly become friends. I mean, you don't get to have an experience like this without bonding over it, right? After Lugia lets them get off for the night, the two make their way back to the new lab where Chloe greets them and isn't happy that Go wasn't there for the opening. On the good side, Go took some footage of the Lugia as they explained to the professor what happened and what research data that they could provide based on what they learned. Because of this, Professor Cerise offers them a chance to work for him as researchers, whose goal is to meet and learn from as many Pokemon as possible, all in the name of his research. Go jumps to saying yes as Ash gets everything that could be an excuse taken care of for him to stay, as he can live at the lab much like Chloe and Go, with even Mimi getting able to stay there and help out. Go gets offered to pick a Kanto starter Pokemon for his own adventure, but he refuses, saying that Mew will be his first Pokemon. <laughs> I doubt it. But Ash and Go also are given some phones, where just like in the Alola region, both get taken over by some Rotom, making them Rotom phones. To tie into the new video games at the time, Ash and Go learn about the Gala region, and the special powers that are locked to that region only, where they both get excited to go and investigate it to report back their findings and studies upon returning. Going to this new land is very exciting for them. Beyond just what will be special about this place later, the two just like to travel at this point. This brings us to meeting Scorebunny, the fire starter for the region, where the two end up trying to trace and track the bunny down, and this wild chase throughout the city ends up with Go potentially having an attachment to Score Bunny. As after dealing with the situation that they're in and continuing on in the region, the Score Bunny ends up making the decision to want to be with Go following him now to get on a train that both Ash and Go have boarded. As the train passes some more open land, it comes to a stop letting us all experience the wild area, which are these sprawling locations full of Pokemon that trainers can enjoy and explore in large open parts of land between major cities and towns. Ash and Go are excited to see what they can find and learn within this wild area, as now they also spot Score Bunny following them around, with Ash suggesting to Go that he thinks the Score Bunny wants to be caught by him, coming all this way to prove that. But Go is just all like, nah, you're not Mew. Hop out of here already. Okay, maybe not to that degree, but he still tells the Score Bunny that Mew is his target first Pokemon to catch, causing Score Bunny to feel embarrassed for coming all this way and overall just being sad at Go's response, truly thinking that there was something special there between them. But now they end up seeing a Snorlax that has this red energy coming down that lands on it, seemingly taking over the Pokemon as we see Snorlax Gigantamax in the wild, as not only the size of the Pokemon changes, but the appearance does as well, literally having its own ecosystem growing right on its big old belly. But they need to spring into action and help it as this massive, tired beast is now completely blocking the train tracks, making things worse with limited time before the train would actually collide with that spot on the train tracks being covered now. Moving a regular Snorlax with a polka flute? No problem. Moving a Snorlax larger than anyone has ever seen before that if not moved could have dire consequences? Probably a bigger problem. Go spots a large berry that has grown on the tree on Snorlax's stomach, thinking that the real way to get Snorlax to wake up would be to get it hungry and and eat. As they struggle to get this berry and fully move it to get Snorlax up, Scorbunny still decides to help out, despite feeling pretty soured over Go rejecting him. Go does see Scorbunny trying his best as he asks Scorbunny to use double kick on the berry, providing enough force to get the berry moving as Snorlax semi wakes up to make sure it catches the berry in its mouth before slamming back down as the force of the slam causes the approaching train to come to a halt. Which is good in a way, no major accident actually happened, only some major delays. But that's the beauty of public transit, right? Well, not in Japan. It's actually incredible there, and I'll explain my connection by mentioning Japan later on. For now, Go thanks the Score Bunny for the help as their teamwork saved the day, and while the bunny appreciates the compliments from Go, the happiness is short-lived, realizing it doesn't matter anyway, Go already rejected his want to travel with him. But Go stops the Score Bunny from walking off, and to the Score Bunny's surprise, Go offers Score Bunny to be his first Pokemon, getting over the pretty ridiculous idea of needing Mew to be his first Pokemon, and can still have that want to eventually obtain Mew. This nice moment is ruined a bit though since Go has no Pokeball throwing experience and just can't properly capture Score Bunny, so the rabbit just goes up to the Pokeball, kicking the center button and capturing itself, giving Go his first ever official Pokemon as Ash is excited to see this for him. Score Bunny comes back out as we see a cool signature high five or 
high foot or whatever would be the name of this half and half concoction as uh, high limb. Regardless, Go starts a nice friendship with his new Pokemon as both him and Ash head back to the Kanto region to discuss what they witnessed with the Gigantamaxing Snorlax to the Professor. Scorbunny, however, wants to settle in with being friends with Pikachu and hopefully the Yamper there, but that Yamper be yapping, only becoming chill thanks to Pikachu, with Scorbunny feeling a bit left out, cluing us into some more complex feelings that the Fire Rabbit may struggle with in the future. So now that we've gotten a taste of what I mean about region hopping, you can see how much more open this series already feels, where we can go and spend a couple episodes in the Gala region and then come right back to the Kanto region as a nice little home base. It's pretty cool to see. Now capturing his first Pokemon, Pokemon and getting over needing to capture Mew first, Go catches the catching bug and then literally goes and catches every bug in the Kanto region he could. That may be the most fun sentence I've ever written. Seriously though, Go captures anything possible, but it does show him failing to catch several other Pokemon as well, but it helps him realize that he now wants to capture every single Pokemon, and Mew is the ultimate chase Pokemon for him. There's over 1,000 Pokemon now, good luck with that bud. Plus stuff like legendary Pokemon, <laughs> Mew is already a crazy goal, but do you think you're casually going to capture even one legendary Pokemon with ease? Shocking everyone that you did so? Why do I have a feeling that will happen at some point? Anywho, to house all of these Pokemon, Professor Cerise surprises Go and Ash with this massive biodome ecosystem for the Pokemon to live in a nicer open space, which is much better than just being stuck in a Pokeball and transferred to a PC somewhere, sitting in this storage system, alone until the trainer decides otherwise. The regional traveling continues as Ash and Go head to the Hoenn region for the Battle Frontier, specifically so Ash can partake in the Flute Cup competition, wanting to enter in with Pikachu and Mimey, which is cool to see Ash take Mr. Mime to go do something fun and out of the ordinary for that Pokemon. Go reluctantly decides to join in on the competition as well, mainly because Ash's persuasion is infectious, but sometimes maybe not the good kind of infectious. Go does perk up once they arrive to the Hoenn region, seeing plenty of new Pokemon on to go and catch. For the first round, Go is up as this will be his first ever trainer battle, having his Score Bunny and Scyther to use. He sends out Scyther first to go up against his opponent's Mightyana, but didn't stand too much of a chance being that he's literally brand new to battling. Mightyana takes out Scyther with Go feeling bad for his Pokemon. Still continuing on though, sending out Score Bunny next, but again, Mightyana defeats Score Bunny with ease, and this loss hurts Go, as he rushes to the Pokemon Center and is realizing that he just isn't into battling. He just likes catching Pokemon, much like the base concept of Pokemon Go. Ah, you know what? His name makes sense now. He then quickly goes off to catch more Pokemon, even though Ash wanted to have him watch him in the tournament. After some time has passed, Ash has made it to the finals to face off against the same trainer that beat Go, as Go returns from his adventures to finally watch Ash battle. Ash has Mimey come out first, facing off against the trainer's other Pokemon, a Hariyama. Mimey displays some awesome moves in battle, using those mime skills to show off both tactics and strength to defeat such a powerful Pokemon like Hariyama. While everyone is cheering on Mimey, and he did appreciate getting a chance to battle for once, he's just done for now, letting Pikachu take the field instead to face off against the Mighty Anna from earlier. Pikachu's ability to string multiple attacks together to create a strategy that can help in almost every situation is always fun to see, being able to overcome the Mighty Anna's speed tactic and then counter being hit and thrown into the air by slamming down with an iron tail, making it more powerful thanks to the force of gravity as he defeats the Mighty Anna and Ash officially wins this random little side tournament. For winning, Ash receives a cool set of flutes and Go admits that seeing Ash battle makes battling seem a lot more fun than what he experienced during his first battle. After returning home, they head right back out from the Kanto region as they've stumbled across a Piplup that has washed up to the shore and was extremely hungry. With the lab getting a call from the Piplup's trainer, Lauren, they learn that the Piplup just up and swam off for no reason, so Ash and Go decide to help return the Pokemon to her in the Sinnoh region. Piplup doesn't seem too happy about this as they now arrive just in time for the Pokemon Iceberg race, which does capture some interest between them. But Lauren meets up with Ash and Go with Piplup not giving her the time of day. This all stems from her other Pokemon, a Krogon, that Piplup doesn't get along with. Lauren tells the others how her and her Piplup met, and how close they became, even winning the same iceberg race the previous year. But when Krogunk came around and fought for her attention, Piplup became angry and jealous and eventually swam off. With how good of a swimmer Krogunk is, Piplup wanted to prove that it can be better, thus the reason why it just kept swimming. But returning to the conversation now with entry slips for the race, Piplup has signed itself, along with Krogunk, up for it. 
but this is a match between these two same trainer team rivals. And as they are neck and neck approaching the finish line, they both notice Lauren needs help with her glasses as they've been knocked off and sunk down into the water, as both of them have individually helped her with this before and that's how they each became her friend, as then they decide to both abandon finishing the race, as she's also hanging over a guardrail of this boat that she was on, leaving her in even more danger all thanks to Team Rocket shenanigans. Together, Krogunk and Piplup save Lauren and get her glasses back as they all share in a nice hug with the two rivals getting past their fight for her attention. When they realize, hey, there's plenty to go around, uh, but then a Psyduck comes around and helps Lauren retrieve her glasses after she dropped them again, and both her other Pokemon fear that Psyduck is getting all the attention from her now. Uh, but there is an easier way to solve this. You know, you just get one of those uh, strings that attach your glasses together to hang around the back of your neck, and boom, problem solved. Ash and Go head back to Kanto now after all that. Another significant moment comes from their next bit of traveling, with reports from the Johto region that Ho-Oh has been spotted there recently. Ash wants to go and battle against it after all this time since seeing the legendary Pokemon on the first day of his Pokemon journey, and Go just wants to catch it. Once they arrive, they head to the bell tower, as there they believe to see Ho-Oh in the sky, having Pikachu send in an attack, but really, it was two Pokemon in a disguise, with their trainer responsible being outed to Ash and Go, as Go thinks that all the reports were a hoax thanks to this trainer being behind it all. This trainer, named Chad and his grandfather, have this weird relationship to their feelings of if Ho-Oh is real or just a legend, as the grandfather did believe at one point, even getting Chad a rainbow wing from when he claims he had an encounter from some time ago but now doesn't believe in the legendary bird existing. Despite Ash saying, nuh uh, I saw one. Ho-Oh is definitely real, but the grandfather brushes it off saying he only thought he saw what he saw. So through helping out trying to prove that Ho-Oh is real so Chad can make his grandfather happy to see the Pokemon does exist and to relive those feelings he once had from his past, the group head to the top of the bell tower as the rain comes to an end, with Chad holding up the rainbow wing and calling upon the legendary Pokemon to appear. A rainbow presents itself in the sky with nothing happening until a gust of wind takes the rainbow wing and delivers it to Chad's grandfather's hands. And having seen the belief that his grandson has along with Ash and Go, he starts feeling some hope about Ho-Oh existing once more, joining in and calling out for Ho-Oh to appear. After a bit, with nothing happening, the grandfather still is filled with this sense of joy that he hasn't had in a long time and wants to continue looking to find Ho-Oh again one day, offering Chad to join him on these adventures. At this moment, the rainbow wing begins to glow, but Ash, Chad, and Go head inside for some food since they're all a bit hungry, but the grandfather stays outside for a moment longer, noticing that Ho-Oh has appeared in the distance, giving proof to him once more that this legendary creature is truly real and not just a legend. But no one else saw, so he becomes content with just enjoying the moment he's experienced here. Who's that Pokemon? <laughs> Back in the Kanto region now, Ash and Go are sent to go find and report about Dragonite Island, an exclusive club for only Dragonites in their evolutionary line that is not easy to find. Ash and Go, however, get caught in a bad storm when searching for it and wake up to find themselves surrounded by Dragonite as they realize where they are. One of the Dragonites, along with a Dragonair, give Ash and Go a tour of the island, and it's a beautiful area that can't be found on any GPS as it's kept private from the world. But at one point, Ash witnesses some Dragonair learn how to earn their ability to fly around, but takes note that their guide Dragonair clearly hasn't learned yet. Ash eventually learns how the other Dragonair were able to do so, thanks to the move Dragon Dance, as he then offers to somehow train the Dragonair who can't fly yet to learn the move. After a bit of wacky training, Ash helps the Dragonair have that breakthrough moment and fully learn Dragon Dance, giving it the ability to fly like all the others, but this joyous moment stops when Dragonair notices something is off, because Team Rocket planned to pretend to be shipwrecked to bring the Dragonite to them, but of course their plans get foiled, but through that Ash is sent flying into the sky, as Dragonair then swoops down to try and save him, but Dragonair's body is just too slippery for Ash to hold on to, so the love and gratefulness it feels towards Ash causes it to evolve into a Dragonite, successfully being able to catch Ash. After all of the commotion, the Dragonite has become very fond of Ash, giving him a big hug as it would like to join Ash on his adventures. Ash excitedly catches the Dragonite now, adding a fan favorite OG Pokemon to his team. Even though they went to this island for research purposes to help map out where it is, if it even was real, they decided against making its location public knowledge 
much for the sake of the Dragonite line of Pokemon living there in peace. Speaking of OG fan favorites, we start learning about that the lab may be haunted by a Gengar, but more on that later. Now we get to officially learn about the biggest competition in the world, the World Coronation Series. This all boils down to see who is the strongest trainer, in every aspect of the word, in the world is. Yeah, this title isn't regional. This title is for the entirety of the world, if the name of the competition didn't give that away. Finally, the real challenge Ash has been waiting for, his whole 25-ish years of being 10 years old. This go around for the event is coming to a close already as Ash and Go get tickets to witness the finals take place in the Gala region. They even see a mostly obscured mysterious Pokemon go past the plane before landing in the region. Just putting that out there, that could be for something later. Probably something not good. But the final match to determine the world champion, aka the Monarch, is preparing to happen as we see a familiar face return to the show. The mysterious Elite Four member and G-Man member, Lance, who we haven't seen in quite some time, so that's cool. His opponent, however, is Leon, the reigning Monarch and champion, as Lance starts off with that shiny Gyarados he took responsibility of way back when, and Leon sends out his Charizard. With the battle between the two Pokemon being extremely aggressive, the power levels are about to get even higher, as Lance uses the power of of Dynamaxing to make his Gyarados more massive and stronger, as Leon responds with what the crowd was waiting for, having his Charizard Gigantamax to become this new massive flamed winged beast, as the audience enjoys what feels like this kaiju fight right in front of them, with how huge these Pokemon now are. While Gyarados sure is a lot more powerful than it was moments ago, Lance's Gigantamax Charizard is just on another level, as it takes out Lance's Gyarados, leaving Leon the reigning champion of the world. Ash is beyond impressed with what he just saw, and is chomping at the bit to have a battle with him. Team Rocket starts some trouble with this now Gigantamax Dreadnought outside the arena, with Ash and Go not too sure about how they can combat a Pokemon as big and powerful as this is right now. But just then, through the cracks in the ground, a familiar glowing red light shines through as it energizes Pikachu, forcefully growing him into his Gigantamax form, surprising them all. But this huge Pikachu now has to find its footing, no longer being able to be the fast little electric mouse it usually is. Ash does his best to figure out how to command Pikachu in this situation, as Leon takes witness to this, finding it odd that Ash doesn't have a Dynamax band that would allow him to have the power to Dynamax or Gigantamax his Pokemon in the first place. Now with help from Leon telling Ash what to do in the battle, Pikachu is able to defeat the Dreadnought as it returns back to its smaller regular form along with Pikachu returning to his. Leon comes to speak with Ash about what happens as Ash quickly challenges Leon to a battle, but they are both interrupted about illegally Dynamaxing Pokemon in the area, right outside of the stadium, but Leon says that Ash is a hero and saved the stadium from any worse damage than it already received, getting Ash off the hook. Ash spends the next day contemplating everything he just saw from Leon's battle, still wanting to face him, as Go tells him to sign up for the next World Coronation series as if he wants to make his way to the top 8 trainers to take part in the finals, then he would need to register in the series, see where his ranking placement would be, and start earning his way up through the ranks to become one of the top 8 trainers in the world to make it there. The rankings are broken down for Ash for the top trainers. There are four groups to be in, with the normal class being any trainer with the rank of 1,000th, best trainer in the world, or anything beyond that. From there, to be a part of the great class, you need to be ranked between the 100th and 999th best trainers in the world. Moving up to Ultra class, you must be ranked between the 9th and the 99th best trainer in the world. And finally, the Master class, or the top 8 trainers in the world. Winning battles is how you move through the ranks, and Ash sure does love to battle. But before he signs up, Leon is giving Ash a fun, unofficial battle, and even giving him a Dynamax band to control those abilities, while in the Gala region sense these abilities to do so for their Pokemon is special to the energy radiating from Galar. As they begin to battle with both Pikachu and Charizard respectively, they both end up Gigantamaxing their Pokemon to make the battle more exciting, and to really help give Ash a taste of what may come in the future, and what he should really train and prepare for. Pikachu does his best through Ash's strategies, but the sheer power of a much more trained Pokemon and the mastery of this ability? Charizard defeats Pikachu with Ash losing the battle. Leon loved the battle though, with Ash asking to battle again in the future as he accepts it with a smile. This next step of his journey is fully unlocked for him. To be able to become a Pokemon Master, his next part of this path is to officially enter in the World Coronation Series and defeat Leon to become a World Champion, as we now return back to the Kanto region. We get to experience some more traveling like going back to the Unova region, which is cool, but remember when I mentioned Gengar earlier? Well, back in Kanto at the lab, Ash ends up coming across the Gengar 
as the other lab scientists try and figure out why the Gengar is here and haunting this place, as the professor goes into exactly why, as this place was supposedly haunted when he bought it. Well, come to find out, after Gengar is messing around with Ash a bunch, causing him to leave the lab for a while, Ash runs into a specific person in the streets of Vermilion City. And then we quickly find out that that Gengar was abandoned by that same person Ash had just bumped into, as the guy starts reflecting on how happy he was to abandon it, claiming how bad it was in battle and just being glad that Gengar has been gone now for three years. The guy promised the Gengar he'd return to pick it up from this abandoned site that eventually turned into the lab, but of course the man never showed up as Gengar has been waiting there ever since, trying to scare anyone there to leave in the meantime. Gengar, who has been hidden within Ash's shadow here, appears, now emotionally angry, at his former trainer after hearing all of these awful things being said. This causes Gengar to start attacking his former trainer until he runs off, but Gengar ends up disappearing as well, not willing to hear anything from Ash about it. And Ash hates that Gengar was so mistreated, and has always had a soft spot for the Pokemon that are. Team Rocket overhears all of this happen and ends up going to Gengar first to trick it into working with them, but luckily Ash comes around and tries to persuade Gengar into helping get Team Rocket out of there, as Gengar is shocked that Ash, after all the ghostly torture he's been putting him through, is showing that he cares about him. Ash then shows that he trusts the Gengar, but puts no pressure on it to trust him back right away, and Gengar feels something his old trainer never gave it, love. After Gengar helps take care of Team Rocket, he later on throws a Pokeball to Ash, with the intention of having Ash catch him. Ash does so, as he now gets another really cool and iconic OG Pokemon on his team. We start seeing some bonds breaking between Go and Scorbunny, showing more signs of this on the Pokemon side once Scorbunny evolves into Raboot. Aside from already having this edgier look character design-wise, the Pokemon just doesn't have the same high spirits it once had, not fist bumping Go after it evolved from fighting against and then beating Team Rocket. As that builds up in the background, Ash goes to officially enroll in the World Coronation series and learns that more than 10,000 participants are involved. The lower the rank number is on a trainer you battle and beat, the lower your number will go. So Ash ends up having a battle with Lieutenant Sarge's gym leader substitute while he's out of town training, with their ranking being 2109 and this would help Ash greatly reduce his ranking to a way better one. We start off with the classic Pikachu versus Raichu matchup, and with this Raichu being trained just like Sarge's, the battle is tough on Pikachu, causing Ash to switch out to Gengar so Pikachu wouldn't be out of the fight just yet. Gengar gets to have some fun showing just how powerful it can be, and despite its previous trainer claiming it never won a battle for him, Gengar proves that it can, taking out the Raichu. The second Pokemon is an Electrode though, and unfortunately Gengar couldn't keep up with it in battle, getting knocked out, with Pikachu needing to come back in. After a bit, when Electrode goes to explode itself, Pikachu saves himself from it by shielding within an Electro web, revealing that Electrode has knocked itself out, and Ash is the winner. With that, Ash's new ranking comes all the way down to 3763, leaving him far from his goals, but a lot closer along his way. Continuing on with these battles, Ash has another opportunity to make larger leaps in ranks when facing this trainer named Oliver, who sends out his Meganium to go against Pikachu. Their battle battle isn't long, but Oliver's Meganium proves to be quite powerful as Pikachu works to combat a lot of the attacks coming his way. Luckily, Pikachu Iron Tails Meganium's throat, knocking it out and cutting Ash's rank more than half to 1512. In another similar battle, Ash faces off against Hayden, who uses his Tauros as Ash uses Pikachu again, ending in a win for Pikachu thanks to his Thunderbolt taking the bull out. But the rankings here aren't established to our knowledge as viewers as a mysterious Pokemon egg and Ash are having this weird connection based Based on aura waves. Soon later, Ash gets given this egg from Nurse Joy, and surprise, it turns out to be a Ryalu, the pre-evolution of Lucario, and an Evo line that fans of the series have wanted Ash to have ever since Lucario first came around in the franchise. After doing a little bit of search and rescue with Ryalu, the newborn Pokemon wants Ash to catch it, officially adding Ryalu to his team. Raboot and Go continue their problems, especially after going to the Hoenn region, where Raboot becomes a rebel with a cause, with that cause being, it wants to dance. While Raboot has been cold and disobedient to Go ever since it evolved, Go sees how happy he is with this ragtag group of random wild Pokemon in the area, making friends with them and even showing that he's happy being there, completely opposite of the emotions Raboot expresses around Go. Go decides Raboot would be happier here and blames himself for holding the moody rabbit from finding its happiness, letting it stay with these Pokemon as he leaves on a train with Ash, but realizes that he's just leaving without telling Raboot, no real goodbye, so he tearfully tries to run off the train but it's too late, it's already started going. To his surprise though, Raboot appears and was joining back around like usual, as Go breaks down in 
happiness when he realizes Reboot is there and even offered Go an apple, seeing how sad he was. Reboot offers a smile to him for the first time as they hug and just bask in each other's company again. Continuing their traveling to other regions, we end up back in the Kalos region where Ash has another battle to move through the rankings with Pikachu defeating a Cloitzer, as Ash now moves to the ranking of 1022, making him so close to entering in the Great Class rankings. But Ash and Ryalu sense something, leading them to find a Lucario not far from them as they recognize it as none other than Karina's Lucario, as she is there in the area as well. Excited to see Ash now having a Ryalu, the two catch up and realize they both plan on taking down Leon in the World Coronation series, with her current ranking being slightly better than Ash's at 1001, meaning she's right on the edge of entering the next class even more so. They decide to battle here, of course, with Ash having Ryalu watch and study Lucario from the sidelines. The battle starts off with Karina sending out her Minfu and Ash sending out Gengar, but after a few attacks, she swaps to her Lucario, who swiftly defeats Gengar. Hmm, maybe that other trainer was right about Gengar. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, it's a bad joke, I'm sorry. She swaps back between the two Pokemon as Ash sends out Dragonite, giving it a chance to shine in battle, and shine it does, defeating the Minfu with a Dragon Claw attack, leaving the fate of the battle up to Lucario again to face Ash's Dragonite. She mega evolves Lucario without hesitation, as Dragonite gives it all it's got, and still ends up pretty hurt from Mega Lucario's attacks. By the end of their battle, both Pokemon go in for one final move, colliding and hurting each other pretty badly, as now they try and outlast each other in stamina to stay standing. But Lucario ends up collapsing, making Ash the victor, and technically now a great class ranked trainer, with his new score being 921. Ryalu is in awe of Lucario though, hoping to be as strong as Karina's one day, with Karina and Ash enjoying the battle in general. Ash and Go then head back to the Galar region for a bit as Ash ends up battling a Galarian Farfetch, giving Ryalu some good training, but he even roots for the regional variant to keep fighting hard as well when it gets close to fainting. Thanks to this, and with Ash bringing the Pokemon to the Pokemon Center and getting it all healed up, when Ash asks if it wants to join his team to train and become stronger, the Galarian Farfetch'd agrees, with Ash now officially capturing it. Go gets himself another Galarian starter Pokemon, with this time being a Sobble, as they return back to the Kanto region. Who's that? Ash is really focused on Ryalu, especially since they have that aura connection as Pikachu starts feeling sidelined and forgotten about. After defeating another trainer, a part of the World Coronation series, and his Electabuzz, Ash's rank moves a little bit, becoming 901. Ash is really pushing hard on Ryalu, claiming to keep using Ryalu in Coronation battles for now, and Pikachu really starts taking this to heart. Even though we've seen Ash sideline Pikachu so many times before, even having a whole series where Ash spends more time with a Froakie that ends up becoming a ninja that Ash can essentially fuse with, but now Pikachu feels some type of way. After Ash's mom comes to visit and Pikachu feels lots of love from her, he notices how little Ash has been giving to him, as Pikachu decides now to make his way back by himself to Pallet Town, leaving Ash with Ryalu behind. The jealousy and sadness Pikachu feels made it hard for Mimi to convince Pikachu to stop, so for now, Mimi just keeps company with Pikachu along the journey to Pallet Town. By the time they end up reaching Pallet Town, Pikachu has had plenty of time to think, and decides to head back wanting to still be with Ash. But to his surprise, Ash was there now too, heading back to get Pikachu, as he apologizes to his best buddy for making him feel the way he did. And since they're there, at least they got to enjoy some of Ash's mom's home cooking, ending the night with them passing out together to sleep, and all is well. Ash soon finds himself with another battle for rank against Krikatina, who, funny enough, uses Heracross for the battle with Pikachu coming out to face it, as yet another smaller battle ends in Ash's face bringing him to 890. He also gets to meet one of the gym leaders for the Galar region, B, and he has a battle with her for rank for the Coronation series. Ash gives his Farfetch'd the chance to battle with B, who's using her Halucha, as the latter is able to get Farfetch'd to drop his leak, making it the only thing it can focus on trying to get it back. But even when it is able to get it back, the Halucha just shows off some wrestling skills to defeat Farfetch'd. At this moment, she ends up switching out to her Graplocked, as Ash sends in Ryalu. The fight Ryalu puts up is admirable, as it shows off a lot of great technique from the training Ash has done with it. But Graplock was just too powerful, getting Ryalu in an unbreakable Octolock as B tells Ash to call the match for the sake of Ryalu, but Ash doesn't, pushing Ryalu to maybe a little bit of an unsafe limit here as it couldn't break free, with Graplock pulling off a final move, knocking it out, causing Ash to lose the battle and go back in the rankings to 930. This starts sending Ash into a battle funk as his next match against an Octillery results in Ryalu being defeated again, and Ash dropping for 
further down in the rankings, now at 975. But it doesn't stop there, as he reactively takes another battle against a Tentacruel, with Ryalu once again getting knocked out. This pushes Ash's ranking all the way back to 1021, regressing him from the Great class back to Normal class. With his confidence soured a bit, and him losing constantly, Go helps inspire Ash to get back into the right headspace, and with his own battle skills from him fighting and catching a Flygon, Ash does come around again from seeing it. Pikachu and Ryalu are both there for Ash to support him, as Ash feels like himself again. For a quick bit of R&R though, Ash takes Go to the Alola region as we get a nice little reunion with the other students from the Pokemon school that Ash attended in the last generation, catching up with them and their lives with Go getting to learn about the Z-Crystals and Z-Moves native to the region. We also see that Professor Kukui and Professor Burnett had their baby. This feels like a nice little bit of an epilogue for the Sun and Moon era. Later in the Johto region once more, Ash and Go run into B, as she has gone significantly up in the rankings. We also get to see one of the gym leaders from that region, Chuck, make an appearance, as Ash recounts their battle together from back in the day. Off camera, Ash was able to have more battles and win them to raise in the rankings again, returning back to the Great class, as B and him then get into a rematch. This time she sends out Hitmontop with Ash using Pikachu. Even though this Beyblade enjoying Pokemon makes it difficult for Pikachu to land some solid attacks, Pikachu ends up coming out on top. B brings Graplocked out now and pulls a similar move to what it did to Ryalu in the last match, getting the best of Pikachu and knocking him out. Ryalu steps up to battle looking for redemption, being able to break free of the grip it was put in last time. But as they both collide with close combat and force palm, both Pokemon end up knocking each other out, settling this match as a draw with no ranks changing. B thinks Ash did pretty good with Ryalu, being able to escape that deadly embrace Graplock has. But now, it's time to get into the video game storyline, taking plot points and aspects of the Sword and Shield games as things in the Gala region may just get a bit tough, as Ash and Go head back that way for now as Ash's Dynamax ban is starting to glow red on its own. At one point, Go runs off to capture a Bunnelby, with Ash and Tail as they head into the Slumbering Weld, with the fog in that area making it hard to keep up with the Pokemon. On top of that, Ash and Go become separated from one another, leading to Ash getting greeted by the legendary Pokemon Zacian, while Go ends up meeting the opposite legendary Pokemon Zamazenta. They both realize quickly that whether trying to battle the Pokemon or catch them, that their attacks or Pokeballs go through them, leaving them unfazed. The fog gets worse with the wolf-like legendaries howling as we snap back to them individually waking up at different points in the area and still being by themselves. They both end up witnessing something weird happening in the sky, as what seems like stars are falling down across the region, but instead of being something magical to witness, it turns out to be deadly for the region real fast, with the falling stars hitting Pokemon, instantly transforming them to their Dynamax or Gigantamax forms, causing destruction to their surroundings. Ash jumps in to help against the Gigantamax Centiscorch, with Leon flying in to help out as well, quickly taking care of the rampaging beast and getting it to revert back to its original size and look. Leon tries to calm the people of the area, claiming that he will figure out what is going on and stop it, as Ash begs him to let him help, and who can say no to this kind of pure soul just wanting to help out. Ash gets on his Dragonite and follows Leon on his Charizard as they head to the other areas that need their help. During this, Go is able to reach Ash with a phone call as they catch up about what's happening on each other's end of things, as they plan to hopefully meet up later on, but for now, Ash and Leon begin to stop the next Dynamax outbreak infected Pokemon, with Dynamax Pangoru popping up to cause uncontrollable trouble. And all of that was just the start of the darkest day bit of story that was from the video games, with the major moments all about to take place, but more surprisingly, this early on into the series, not being a season 2 or season 3 thing, but rather just jumping into the madness and major moments right from the jump essentially. Go works with Sonia, the assistant to the professor of the Gala region, Magnolia, as well as being her granddaughter, as they try to understand more about the mystery of an ancient hero told through modern day as this legend of the land, and an event that happened 3,000 years ago called the Darkest Day, fearing that it is what is happening once more. Based on their research thus far, they consider that the cause behind this event and for everything happening now is the work of an unknown legendary Pokemon. Thanks to Team Rocket getting involved in the way they do, being told by Giovanni to sneak into this underground power plan in the Gala region, we get to overhear and see special Galar particles being forcefully put into the core of the power plant, purposely causing the outbreak of these Dynamax Pokemon. This provides evidence that the person behind this all is Rose, the chairman of the Galar League, and the person responsible for taking care of all the power and resources for energy in the region, who has some deeper ties to characters like Leon and Sonya. He mentions the name of a Pokemon called Eternatus, that will soon be resurrected thanks to all of this energy, and apparently it can save the Galar region. Go 
Poe and Sonya dig in deeper to understand the original legend of the hero, finding out that the stories told today are wrong, as there wasn't just one legend, but two potentially. Leon and Ash take down more Dynamax and Gigantamax Pokemon as Rose and his secretary Alina say hi to them and Leon introduces them to Ash, and mentions that Rose was the one who discovered Leon's talents to help position him for his career in battling he's reached. We also see that Rose is kinda shady, acting dumb in regards to the whole Dynamax issue, even though he's the one behind it. Rose wants to get Ash and Leon to stop stopping his doings, as he invites them to a special dinner, with Ash being hungry and Leon saying that he should go because it may be worth it for him. Because as for now, Rose is a person in Leon's life that helped change his for him, but Leon does think that something may be a little bit off. Because of this, he now sneakily investigates the energy plant to see if any of that is connected to what's happening, and furthermore, if Rose is involved in any way, hoping that's not the case. During Ash's dinner with Rose, he is offered for Rose to represent him as a trainer in general, believing in Ash the way he did Leon. Ash denies this though, as he wants to travel on his own path forward to earn what he gets in life, not wanting his dreams to be more spoon-fed to him, but going out and finding the real meaning of becoming a Pokemon master, all on his own. You know, that's not to say that, you know, that Leon didn't earn where he got, he's definitely a great trainer, I'm just saying. Go and Sonya eventually find a long, hidden from the world area behind this main mural in these rooms that they're in, proving that there were two knights who fought to stop the darkest day together, as they had Zacian and Zamazenta with them. They take notice of the sword in the mouth of Zacian, and the shield bodied Zamazenta. Leon finally finds the core of this energy leading him to the summit of the tower, seeing it in action caused the red star-like bits to go and affect Pokemon throughout the region. At this point, Eternatus emerges from the core as Leon figures out Rose is behind this all. Go and Sonya head to find Zacian and Zamazenta where Go and Ash encountered them earlier. They both appear to Go at once, but leaving in the mist quickly. But Go moves further in, finding the altar of the legend as they find both a rusted sword and shield there, grabbing them and heading over to the Hammerlock Gym, where Eternatus is currently at after breaking free. Rose meets with Ash and Leon at the stadium to deal with Eternatus, but Rose shows up and mentions his evil plans, claiming themselves to be doing this for the good of Galar's future. Rose tries to manipulate Leon into doing his bidding, and that it's doing a good thing for the future, mentioning that Leon needs to catch Eternatus in order to control it and use the Pokemon as this infinite well of energy to keep Galar operational, as Rose claims that the region has used all of its resources up, and he vowed to find an alternative way to create energy ever since his dad died in an accident while working in the mines. Wow, this is very political for Pokemon in a way. But eventually, Leon gets convinced by Rose's persuasion to capture the mysterious legendary, as it then begins using its own particles to transform a bit larger to fight back. Leon knows this Pokemon is too powerful though, and with the access to it, only bad things will come, thinking that they have to capture it and then seal it away, rather than using it for its resources for the land, thus disappointing Rose, with Ash jumping in to fight Rose and his Pokemon while Leon figures out how to handle Eternatus. Go is there now as well, fighting against Alina, but for Ash's battle, it's a double battle, with Pikachu and Ryolu facing his Ferrothorn and Kaparaja. During this battle, Rose sends in an attack to hit both Pikachu and Ash, with Ryolu jumping in at the last second to shield them from the blow, as it then evolves into a Lucario on the spot, giving Ash his own Lucario after all this time. Now it makes quick work of Rose's Pokemon, defeating Rose in battle. Eternatus has had enough and transforms even further, becoming a much larger, curled up being with what looks like a terrifying hand reaching down. So not only have we dealt with other Pokemon Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing, but now this thing just Eternamaxed. Great. When it aims a powerful attack at everyone, the rusty sword and shield start glowing, waking up Zacian and Zamazenta as they now rush over, jumping to grab their specific item and transforming into their more fierce crowned modes, ready to fight back against Eternatus. Both of them, along with Ash and Go having their Pokemon attack, end up hitting and weakening Eternatus greatly, as Go finds an opening to throw in a larger Pokeball, officially capturing the legendary beast. So that's wild, right? I mean, we can do that in the games, but that's not how it's really kind of supposed to work in the show. I mean, it's not fair. Ash never gets that kind of cool treatment. He just says bye to the legendary Pokemon like nothing ever happened. With Eternatus captured, Zacian and Zamazenta to leave to head back, now that the battle is over as the dark clouds begin to dissipate from the sky. The darkest day has been avoided and the average amount of sunlight day has begun, but Rose made an escape and went into hiding with Leon setting out to find him. Professor Magnolia is able to take the captured Eternatus and seal the Pokeball away. So sorry, Go, you, you don't get access to that power. And that's good too, because it could corrupt you. So with something so threatening avoided thanks to Ash and Go helping Leon along with the 
two legendary dogs, but what's next? Well, our main duo head back home for now in the Kanto region, but then they also get a potential lead on where Mew could be, getting Go really excited to go and head out on this next bit of field research. Upon this random island that they head to, they run into Mewtwo. So not a bad consolation prize there, right, Go? Ash also recognizes Mewtwo this time as both Ash and Go want to initiate a battle. Yeah, it's a fun and interesting bit of battling, but it's really no use to think that you'd win. This is Mewtwo after all. So yeah, Mewtwo wins. But hey, it enjoyed both of their company and had some fun. But then Mewtwo makes it clear that this secret island of Pokemon is not open to humans being there. Ash and Go then suddenly wake up outside of the lab in Vermilion City, thinking that Mewtwo carefully sent them home. I like to think he just flew over and dropped him, but hey, that's me. But now there are many more journeys to cover in Season 2 of the Journeys era, as we have finally reached the end of a jam-packed Season 1 of the show. From start to finish, the story moments we follow are pretty exciting, constantly building enthralling moments from the World Coronation Series ranking battles, rarely offering some time to breathe, with less focused moments, as we also get a bunch of Go's own adventures of just catching every Pokemon ever. Again, that's a crazy goal, but I support it. Who's that Pokemon? <laughs> Now we enter into the second season titled Pokemon Master Journeys. As we start to get some time building up Chloe's story a lot more than she ever was utilized in the first season, Go ends up asking her a bunch of questions about why she didn't have any Pokemon leading to her saying that she doesn't want to feel the pressure to be like her father and follow in his career path, wanting to pave her own journey forward when she figures out what that actually looks like. She goes into saying that she'll probably never end up having her own Pokemon, but that quickly changes as she builds an attachment to an Eevee very fast and officially has this Eevee become her first Pokemon. She even gets a Rotom phone as she decides to go figure out her future path as it comes. Chloe ends up starting to travel on some adventures with Ash and Go, like when they head to the Galar region to see some pretty cool and rare fossils. But something you either love and think is funny or hate and think is dumb are the fossil Pokemon from Generation 8, as they only have certain complete and incomplete fossils that get mixed up and put together during their revival process, leading to one of the funniest being Dracovish. I mean, look at at it. Existence is pain. And with both Ash and Go getting to look after one of these creatures, Ash adds Dracovish to his team. So yay, a new Pokemon, whatever whatever this thing is. Ash has still been working on his battling for the World Coronation series, currently all the way up to 415 in the rankings, as he has a match with Lester Oak's construction worker here using his Farfetch'd against a Girder. This match has some nice back and forths, but Farfetch'd gets the upper hand here, breaking the Girder's Girder with his leak, and striking the Pokemon directly and defeating it bringing Ash to the new ranking of 381. Ash and Go later on find themselves in the Johto region again, as there have been sightings of the legendary Pokemon Suicune running around, and much to both their excitement, it's truly the legendary Pokemon itself, not just other Pokemon in disguise. Suicune just wanted to keep the lake clean from the polluters that are purposely dumping into it, along with their Pokemon that are shooting sludge into it to make it worse. Ash and Go jump in to help the Suicune from all this madness, and Go ends up randomly just catching the legendary Pokemon as everyone looks in shock, much like all of the viewers as we ask, did, did that just happen? But out of respect for the legendary Pokemon's position in the world having responsibilities, Go offers to let it go back out and be released. But a deal is made where that Suicune will technically be Go's to call upon if needed, but will still go out in the world for now. Go also gets a Grookey on his team. Yeah, the final Galarian starter Pokemon. And now he's got all three of them. Who does he think he is, Ash? Speaking of Ash, he ends up training his Galarian Farfetch'd at the Castle of Chivalry, because everyone can take some time to learn how to be proper and royal, and use that newfound way of life to evolve into a Surfetch'd as it then helps defeat another trainer for rank placement, putting Ash at 184 now. That's cool and all, but I'm feeling pretty nostalgic a bit. So later on, Ash gets a letter from an old pal, Iris, one of the main traveling companions from the Unova region, filled with updates about herself and how she is doing following her goals. She's also taking part in the World Coronation series, currently ranked within the Great Class as well. Ash is excited to read about all of this, but even more so that she invites him to come to the region and have a battle for rank, not wasting any time and heading over there now. As they wait for her to show up and greet them, a grand entrance begins as we see that Iris, since we last left her in the show, has now become the champion of the region. And after some friendly hellos, it is time for them to have an official rank battle. Starting off strong, both Ash and Iris send out their respective Dragonites. Ash's Dragonite is definitely a strong Pokemon, but still has a long way to go to get as strong as it can be, versus Iris's Dragonite, who has had so much training and experience since we last saw it. 
allowing it to take the lead and weaken Ashes quite a bit, causing Ash to swap out Dragonite before it was knocked out. He then sends out Dracovish for an interesting match, but hey, Iris is really fascinated by the hybrid of ancient Pokemon that it is. Luckily, this ancient mismatch is strong, literally catching Dragonite's head in its mouth and then directly attacking it while it's in this compromising position, freezing Iris's Dragonite into a dragon-flavored popsicle and defeating it, giving Ash the first round win. She now sends out her Haxorus, which yes, is her Axew from the black and white era of the show, finally all evolved up to its final form, something the little Axew dreamed of doing and proving Iris is all worthy of being this dragon-type trainer that has fulfilled their destiny tasked with her from back when she lived at her village, and helping Axew become a Haxorus. Displaying a show of force, Haxorus knocks out Dracovish quickly, evening up the match so far. Ash brings back out his Dragonite, hyping it up as Iris starts trying to communicate with it as well on a more human-to-dragon level, seeing that there is some true support and love between Dragonite and Ash, going on to tell it to have a fun time battling as Ash always does, giving some true drive for Dragonite to give it his best shot. With Haxorus and Dragonite now going at it, the two Pokemon hold each other off fairly well, with Ash telling Dragonite to use Draco Meteor that ends up overpowering Haxorus's defenses and knocks it out, leaving Ash the winner of this fun reunion battle between the two old traveling companions. The victory, though, brings Ash's rank to 99, officially filling in the last slot of the Ultra class, bumping him up into a new bracket. The two complement one another on a great battle and look forward to seeing each other again soon. Taking a moment to travel back to Pallet Town and see Professor Oak in his lab, Go ends up discussing with the Professor and Ash about seeing Mew all the way back at summer camp, with the Professor bringing up something called Project Mew, which is a special group of researchers who all share in a goal of looking for Mew, adding other members to the team that have the same goal in mind. While that sounds cool, Go denies Oak's offer to join that team as he currently wants to keep his goal for himself rather than work with the team. In the meantime, Ash gets to see a bunch of his old Pokemon at Oak's ranch, all happy to see him again. Ash gets happy to see another familiar face in the area as well, and that's his longtime rival turned friend, Gary Oak. Gary, in a playful and friendly kind of way, makes comments to test Go to see if he is a good and strong traveling companion for Ash. Go gets a bit offended, but Ash tells Go that Gary is just teasing him, and that he used to get it way worse from Gary back in the day. Gary mentions that the legendary bird Moltres may be around in the area not far from here, as they all tag along with him to see if they can spot the Firebird. They do, however, find Ash's Infernape along the way, who gets happy to see Ash again after all this time. This reunion is interrupted when Moltres does appear as Infernape was looking to challenge the legendary Pokemon. And here it is looking to respond to Infernape. As the battle starts between Infernape and Moltres, Gary jumps in with his Blastoise to help it out. Eventually, Go joins in with his Cinderace, as well as Gary and Ash sending out their electric Pokemon Electivire and Pikachu to aid in the battle as well. The show of force causes Moltres to head away for now as Gary only wanted to battle it to earn from the Moltres what he just got and that was a burning feather, as he is part of the Mew project, and this was a part of his trial mission, that he was sent on to go complete. Seeing Gary be a part of this and all that it entails, Go officially takes up Oak's offer to join in on Project Mew. Continuing on, Ash and Go head to the Sinnoh region for Go to arrive at the Project Mew lab, meeting with Gary once more. At the lab, Go gets introduced to the project itself and the person heading it, Professor Amaranth, and no, they're not a live streamer. The group's main goal is to look for Mew, and for Go here, he needs to learn more about Mew, the project itself, and just overall start to really get into it. And to do that, he must go through several trial missions, like we just saw Gary doing one, in order for the project group to see how smart, tough, and prepared he is when it comes to the world of Pokemon. And after that, you'd be able to move up the ranks in the group to a chaser, being a part of one of the Mew search teams. Go gets put through a qualifier to even see if the trial missions are going to be something he can handle, as he has to go help find and capture an Alolan Ninetales in the area that needs to be returned back to the Alola region after becoming stuck here from a Pokemon hunter who stole it from its home and then their plane crashed in the area. Go accomplishes this and now is able to receive trials to go on as they will eventually get sent his way. Ash and Go get informed from Professor Cerise that a Darkrai may be up to some of their old tricks and keeping people from sleeping thanks to causing awful nightmares for them to experience. As Team Rocket hurt the first line of defense holding back Darkrai from doing this, Cresselia. Chloe ends up heading to the Sinnoh region with Ash and Go already still there, and as she arrives there, she gets interested in hearing and seeing stuff regarding Pokemon contests. In the meantime, she decides to camp in the area near a lake where she runs into a familiar friend that we know, Dawn. She's in the area as she's going to take part in the upcoming contest as the two hang out and get to know each other. Eventually, the two start poking at one another, leading to some arguments, mostly from being deprived of sleep, as they end up having to work together to defend themselves from a ride on with their Eevee and Piplup. 
and being able to defeat it together, each of them are really impressed with how they handled themselves in the battle, becoming friendly with each other once again. And now at the same time, Ash and Go meet the Dark Rye responsible for the nightmares while Don and Chloe encounter the Cresselia, who is currently pretty hurt. Don and Chloe attend to healing and taking care of it as much as they can for now, as the two end up getting into a personal conversation about stuff with Chloe's direction in life of what she wants to do, as Don offers a nice bit of advice and words for her to consider. That sudden realizations that come from long periods of thinking can help build where the great dreams and goals in life come from, and that Chloe wanting to try and do new things is good for her to help figure out that kind of stuff. Seeing what she does or doesn't like, giving her something to think about now when telling her that giving a try at performing in the Pokemon contest could be a lot of fun for her. Team Rocket are the ones who are responsible for causing all the issues here, as they are still currently going after the Pokemon as right now they are engaging in battle with Darkrai trying to capture it, as Ash and Go finally run into Don and Chloe, as they realize just how small of a world it can truly feel like sometimes, as Ash is certainly happy to see a familiar face. In the end, they stop Team Rocket together and set both Darkrai and Cresselia free, as the two are in harmony with one another, with Darkrai having no intentions of causing the nightmares on people that it was doing, and really cared for Cresselia being okay, as they now both head back to their islands. After this, with Chloe interested in trying the contest out, and hanging out with Dawn for a bit, Ash and Go head back to the Alola region once more, and together they compete in a catch adventure race. And you know, Go is perfect for this since he likes to capture every Pokemon ever, and surprise, surprise, they win. Ash is also able to grab his Z Ring and Z Crystal while he's there, as now they head back to the Sinnoh region again for his next World Coronation Series battle with a returning gym leader from there to face, Volkner. Ash starts off with Lucario while Volkner chooses Luxray, making the battle a pretty explosive one right up front. Ash swaps out for Gengar at one point as it starts getting the better of Luxray, causing Volkner to switch it up as well, sending out Fan Rotom. And surprisingly, Gengar gets defeated by it. Ash sends in Pikachu next, who traps Fan Rotom with an Electroweb, but before Pikachu can continue his attacks, Volkner swaps it out again, bringing Electivire out and hitting Pikachu pretty hard, so Ash pulls Pikachu from the match to send back out Lucario for now. Their little bout here leaves Lucario paralyzed, with Volkner swapping out again for Rotom, but Ash calms and focuses Lucario for it to be able to land the perfect attack attack, knocking out Rotom. With Luxray back out on the field, the two Pokemon use their remaining energy to face off once more, as they each directly hit each other resulting in a double knockout. Pikachu and Electivire come back out for the final matchup, but Ash and Pikachu know what they must do to overpower Electivire, and that is to perform the Z-Move 10 million volt Thunderbolt, as the massive attack completely knocks out Electivire, leaving Ash the winner of the rank battle, bringing his ranking up to 64. Falknor is left extremely impressed by Ash and looks forward to seeing what he'll do in the rest of the World Coronation series, especially with some of the toughest opponents in the world left to face off in battle. As some time passes, Go completes further work into his Mew Project trials, and even finds himself catching a shiny Voltorb, which is pretty neat. We also meet Cynthia again, the Sinnoh League champion, who is also in the World Coronation series and perhaps is sitting somewhere in the top 8, being in that master class, but looking forward to how Ash will make his way through the ranks to get there as well, promising her that he will do so. We then meet back up with Karina, with Ash and his Lucario wanting to learn to Mega Evolve for their training. She gives Ash some Mega Gloves that unlock that Mega Evolution link between Ash and Lucario, as together they head out to get the Mega Stone needed for Lucario, so Mega Evolving could even be possible for them. Eventually getting a chance to face off against a Mega Alakazam as Lucario's trial to earn the right to have the Mega Stone. But what the challenge really is, is for Lucario to get past him and get the stone, to which after a bit of battle, Lucario is able to do so, earning the stone for himself. But now it's time for Ash's next major challenge, as he has to face off against B again for a third time. Ash starts off with Pikachu and B starts off with Graplock, with Pikachu struggling to fully pull off any strategized combos. Ash swaps him out for Lucario now, facing off against the Graplock that gave it plenty of trouble as a Ryalu. Lucario comes in fierce to show how much it has grown in strength since evolving and training, but B ends up swapping as well, sending out Halucha instead. Lucario fends off a lot of the attacks from Halucha, but is clearly taking some damage. But seeing Lucario's determination, B swaps again, sending out her Machamp, to which she activates her Dynamax Band to bring forth Gigantamax Machamp. When Lucario becomes fully overpowered by the Hulking Beast, Ash starts activating his Keystone to Mega Evolve Lucario, but to his surprise, Lucario doesn't want to Mega Evolve right now, pulling enough strength on its own without it to attack back, with Ash sorry to his Lucario for trying to push him in an aggressive way to do so. During this moment, Leon shows up to watch and add some commentary over the battle, believing in Ash saying that him and his Lucario 
trio have a really strong bond, and they will perform a mega evolution at the right time for them to be in sync. For now, Ash swaps out Lucario for his Surf Fetch, surprising the viewers of the match with the choice, as B swaps out to Halucha again, who quickly defeats Surf Fetch. Pikachu takes the field once more and is able to keep up with the high-powered fast attacks Halucha can perform, as Pikachu ends things off with a perfectly timed Thunderbolt that takes Halucha out. Graplock comes back out now and takes Pikachu out with its close combat, leaving Ash to just Lucario again. Now, Lucario is able to really show Graplock all that it's trained for, knocking the Octopus out when their powerful moves collide, showing just how much Lucario has been preparing for this moment. Gigantamax Machamp comes back out to the field, where Lucario now gives the signal to Ash that everything's good to go, and when he is ready with the Keystone, as they successfully get in sync and Lucario Mega evolves for the first time, being able to fully keep up with the Gigantamax Machamp. As they go back and forth trying to break the other one back down, Lucario ends up landing a Steel Beam attack that defeats it, leaving Lucario and Ash the victors of this rank match. Ash's new rank is 36, as B shows respect to Ash for the match, looking forward to their next battle, seeing Ash as a truly worthy trainer. Go continues on his Mew Project missions with Ash helping out, as we even see another familiar face along this most recent mission, being one of the Hoenn region's Elite Four members, Drake, as Ash had battled him before in the past. We also get a couple of weird episodes here since it's been a while since we've had some, and somewhere in another dimension, Palkia and Dialga are fighting again. Dawn is having some training struggles with her Piplup in the meantime, but then she becomes frozen in shock over seeing another Dawn grabbing her Piplup and heading through a portal, freaking her out, calling the only number that she knows who can help, Ghostbusters. But they don't pick up, so then she calls Ash to come help. Ash, Go, and Chloe head over to Sinnoh to do what they can to figure out what is happening and how they can help. Ash at first thinks it could be an Ultra Wormhole, but Officer Jenny refers to these portals as more of gates between our world and another. Team Rocket tries doing their usual thing and gets pushed aside, but then a different version of Team Rocket that looked to be cosplaying at a Star Trek convention come around and snatch Ash's Lucario and Go's Inteleon, bringing them back through the gate, as Ash gets knocked back as Go and Don go through the gate before it closes, with Ash and Chloe left on the outside. The place they enter feels like a copy of their same world, just with a different skybox around them. Also, there seems to be no Pokemon around at all as Don and Go head to Don's house in this place and end up confronting the other Don that took her Piplup, who now runs back to her real Don. This other Don starts explaining what has happened here, and with her not having bad intentions in stealing Piplup in the first place, going on to say that one day all the Pokemon started regressing for some reason, de-evolving and eventually becoming eggs again. She apologizes for taking Piplup, but just was overwhelmed at seeing it again, feeling all these emotions ever since it turned into an egg for her. Go notes that this world has been twisted and distorted, with Don bringing up Dialga and Palkia being able to manipulate space and time. Chloe and Ash start trying to figure out things from their end, thinking that Palkia has the ability to go between dimensions, as they head to the library to get some more information about this, where they run into Cynthia. She ends up explaining a lot about both Dialga and Palkia, as well as the creator of all, Arceus. During this, alternate dimension Team Rocket open up a gate to come after them again, but this opens up a chance for them to cross to the other side as Ash and Chloe go through the gate. And when they go through, they end up coming across Ash from the alternate dimension. The other Ash sees our Ash's Pikachu and breaks down in tears, hugging it, as his Pikachu, much like the other Pokemon in this dimension, is nothing more than a Pokemon egg now. Together, they head to regroup with Don and Go, as they meet this dimension's Professor Rowan, who explains that this age-reversing effect isn't only for Pokemon, but anything living as well. Meaning, as humans, they could be getting younger by the minute. Our group here head to the Spear Pillar and enter into the gate there, which brings them to a dark dimension, where the controllers of space and time are still locked in battle. The alternate Team Rocket are the ones responsible for all this happening, using the red chain containing the power of Arceus to cause them to fight in the first place and using the power of Palkia to have gates appear for them to travel through, and Dialga to reverse time, making Pokemon eggs again, so that when time can move forward, Team Rocket can raise every stolen egg that they get into Team Rocket Pokemon from birth. That's a pretty grand plan, especially for Team Rocket, but these alternate versions of them seem smarter anyway, as the funny armor that they wear is blocking the effects of time and space, keeping them safe and okay from what's happening. The Ash, Go, Chloe, and Dawn from this alternate world show up and help, as both Ash go after breaking the red chain, while the others and their otherworld doppelgangers go after Team Rocket. Dialga surges its time power, hitting everyone though, making all their Pokemon turn back into eggs, and them themselves turning into little kids. The only thing that they have left is their feelings, using them to send energy to Arceus, praying for the help to reverse all of this. Arceus ends up appearing, getting rid of the red chain and stopping Dialga and Palkia from fighting to start fixing this problem as everything becomes undone. 
everyone returns to their right age and all the Pokemon come back from their eggs to be their exact same Pokemon that they once were. Getting a chance to say goodbye to the other versions of themselves, Ash, Chloe, Dawn, and Go get brought back to their dimension as everything is okay once more, parting ways with Dawn and Cynthia as Ash, Chloe, and Go head back to the Kanto region. Leaving us off here for the end of the second season of Pokemon Journeys. Yeah, a whole random sci-fi filled adventure to end the season on a really fun note was surprising to see, and I think the story going on for it was genuinely really cool. It's nice to have these larger than life little bits of sci-fi moments in Pokemon here and there, but there is still a whole bunch left to cover as Ash is focused on his run in the World Coronation series, being super close to making it to the top 8, and by extension, facing Leon for his goals of becoming a world champion, as he strives to become a Pokemon master. Who's that Pokemon? <laughs> As we return back to the third season of the show titled Pokemon Ultimate Journeys, we get a little bit of a special set of episodes that tie into the Pokemon Legends Arceus game a bit, as Ash and Go are in the Sinnoh region once more at a festival celebrating the rich history of the region. They end up running into Dawn again as she wants them to get into the spirit of things, taking them to get traditionally dressed as they go off to meet with Cynthia, who is there as well, and gets them fitted out and starts explaining to them a lot about the history of the region. During this, Team Galactic is up to no good and are trying to capture a heat ran as they corner and catch the legendary Pokemon. While Cynthia reveals more about Sinnoh's past, Ash, Dawn, and Go all get to take care of the regional starters, or at least were the regional starters from back then, with Ash going to capture Rowlet, Go going to capture Cyndaquil, and Dawn going to catch Oshawa, just so they can have that full authentic experience in the first place of how trainers would capture Pokemon back in the day. Really, this is all just a tie-in to the video game for a fun bit of content. But then a massive pulse can be felt throughout the area thanks to Team Galactic, having the Heat Ran and the Arceus Energy and fused flame plate in their possession and using them for their plans, with that being to bring back their team leader, Cyrus, after what happened to him in the Diamond and Pearl era of the anime. Arceus is also alerted to the strange feeling, sending out the Lake Guardians to find help in solving whatever this problem is, as they now appear to our group, showing them horrifying visions as Arceus appears to them, quickly scattering away after this, leaving the group confused but letting Ash and Dawn reminisce about working with the Lake Guardians before when they had to help Palkia and Dialga. The group end up running into Brock, who is helping out some Pokemon in the region from all that's going on, but when seeing his old pals and meeting Go for the first time, he decides to go with them on their trip to Mount Coronet, giving them a ride there as he helps break down what the spirits showed them earlier, thinking it was a plea to help out in this situation sent from Arceus itself. With Team Galactic setting things in motion and getting into some more chaos with the Heatran, Ash notices as they approach the madness that it looks like the visions of fire that they saw. Team Galactic ends up bringing the Heatran to the Spear Pillar as the Guardian Spirits try to calm the heat ran down as it changes into a ball of flames and lava. With this immense power and its loud roars, the space and time portal above react to it, as Heatran becomes more powerful than ever thanks to the Arceus flame plate that it's been given with Team Galactic trying to protect Heatran from the others coming to save it and stop their plans, sending out Pokemon to battle. During this, as some are trying to stop Heatran, Brock and Cynthia start digging their way through the mountain, figuring that if they can get to Heatran and make it lose its balance or footing, then the madness can stop, but things may be too late as a beam of energy strikes down on Heatran, feeding it the fuel to now open the space-time rift, but now that this is done, Heatran seems to be a ticking time bomb, ready to go off from the stored energy inside of it now, with enough power to wipe Mount Coronet off the face of the Earth. But again, Arceus appears bringing in some justice over what just happened, stopping the massive damage to the land as well as Team Galactic. Pikachu helps get Heatran free of the flame plate, as all of the Pokemon and people try and stop the explosion from happening, but Arceus is able to contain it once it goes off. Off, with the remaining Team Galactic members begging for answers about the whereabouts of their leader to Arceus, but get no answers. As they are arrested, Arceus flies off and the day is saved in this smaller tie-in adventure. As we then get a look into the past of Pokeballs being made, and this trainer about to set off on his journey into the world of ancient Sinnoh. Fun stuff, but now for the main part of the show, huh? This season also offers some more fun callbacks, like seeing Butch and Cassidy from Team Rocket making a return, but are no longer a part of Team Rocket. I just think they're cool characters and it's a brief surprise to see them again. We meet Sophocles from the Alola region again, as he has his head in the stars for his research and overall interest in life. Going back to the Gala region, Ash and Go end up meeting the technical regional bad guy team, Team Yell, as they have their all-around spirit for the gym leader Pierce and Marnie, with Marnie making her much-anticipated entrance for the anime that fans of her from the video games have been waiting for. Ash also ends up having a rank battle with her, with Ash using Gengar and Marnie using Grimmsnarl, as after a bit she gigantamaxes Grimmsnarl 
Snarl with Ash having to respond by doing the same with Gengar, to make this a way more explosive match, leading to Gigantamax Gengar being able to hit the Grim Snarl once too many turns have happened and the Grim Snarl changed back to the regular version of that Pokemon, knocking it out and leaving Ash the winner with a new rank of 15, with Marnie eventually offering Ash a smile in return for a fun battle as they shake hands and we move on from there. Go continues on with his Project Mew missions alongside Gary and some others, as at one point they end up having to battle against an Articuno. Ash and Go later on end up in the Kalos region once more as we reunite with Clement and Bonnie to catch up with them. Clement also helps Ash run tests and train to fully help out Ash's Surfetched and Dracovish, getting them to learn some new moves and become more ready for future battles, as they end things off with a friendly practice double battle where Ash ends up winning, feeling more confident with these two Pokemon as the two have even bonded with one another. His next rank battle is with the Kalos Elite Four member Drasna as Ash sends out his Surfetched and her sending out Noivern. Hey, good choice. Surfetched is able to last a good bit in battle here, dealing some good damage to the Noivern, but in the end gets hit with a direct Dragon Pulse from Noivern after dodging Surfetched's attack, stunning the Royal Guard of a Pokemon as Ash swaps him out now to send in Dracovish. As it was able to get some powerful attacks back at Noivern, but Drasna does the same, swapping out for her Altaria instead. During the battle, she ends up Mega Evolving it, giving it defense from Dragovish's Dragon-type attacks. Ash then swaps back to Surfetched, who lands a Meteor Assault attack, knocking Altaria out, as well as itself, leaving the battle up to Dragovish and Noivern to close it out. Even though Dragovish is getting bodied a bit by the bat, it still has the strength to stay in the fight, colliding attacks with the Noivern to the result of Noivern collapsing and Ash winning the match, changing his ranking all the way up to 9, meaning he is one placement away from entering the top 8. Ash, Go, and Chloe head back to the Hoenn region, where Chloe ends up the winner of a contest pass and fully gets pushed into giving the contest side of things a shot, and ends up meeting Serena as they discuss Eevee and Eeveelutions, as well as giving her advice about her foraging her own path forward, as Serena sees a lot of herself within Chloe from how she felt with her struggles during the XY era. Ash ends up meeting Wallace again after all these generations, as they reflect back on some stuff like the Wallace Cup, giving us a cool look back of Don and May, but now as Ash and friends are already heading out of the area, Ash spots Serena just a little bit too late as the two have a brief moment of saying hi to each other with smiles on their faces, still hoping to meet in the future as they both work on their goals. For another reunion, Ash meets with his Greninja again, after he heads to the Kalos region, with his Lucario being able to get some practice in with it, as Ash takes note about how similar these two Pokemon are and how they have such a close bond with him in different ways. Ash's next battle to get into the top 8 is with the Galar gym leader Raihan, as he sends out his Flygon with Ash sending in Dragonite for the battle. Both Pokemon offer some awesome fights back and forth, changing up strategies on the fly, but Flygon swoops in quickly to stop Dragonite from sending in Draco Meteor, as he gets hit by Steel Wing and ends up being knocked out. Ash sends out Gengar next, who keeps getting hurt by Flygon, making things look rough as both trainers here really want this win, and have the drive to face and defeat Leon to become world champion. This drive keeps Ash focused, but he needs a new strategy, so instead of waiting to Mega Evolve Lucario like he originally was going to, he decides to Gigantamax Gengar instead, giving it the power to stop Flygon from buzzing around and ends up defeating it. Raihan sends out Gudra as it hits Gengar with a barrage of water and electric attacks that weaken Gengar quite a bit, but Ash sticks with Gengar here as the two Pokemon collide a Hydro Pump with Max Starfall that leaves both Pokemon unconscious and unable to battle. With one Pokemon left each, Ash sends out Lucario as Raihan sends out Duraludon. Things may look bad as Ash already used his one per match special ability boost, as Raihan now uses his, Gigantamaxing his Duraludon into this giant skyscraper of a Pokemon. Things aren't looking too good in Ash's favor, but he stands calm and ready, finding the perfect link with Lucario, syncing up with their auras as Lucario unleashes a world-shattering aura sphere that takes out the Duraludon, making Ash the overall winner, putting his rank now at 8, qualifying him for the Master Class. The final 8 now include Leon, Cynthia, Steven Stone, Deantha, Lance, Iris, Alon, and of course, Ash. In a moment of downtime, we get to revisit and finish off a story from the previous generation about Lily and Gladion, looking for their supposedly alive father. They arrive in the Crown Tundra and follow all the leads that they have to a house where inside a man that seems to be their father is inside, as Lily gives him a hug and Zoroark happily rubs up to him. But the man has no clue who they are, staring at them with confusion as to why they are in his house, why do these kids think that he's their father, and why does this lady think that he's her husband? And also, what the dog doing? After speaking with the man further, who they then confirm by name that it is their father, they deduce that he has amnesia. He does admit that he has a daughter named Lily, funny enough, as they walk into the other room to see Lily playing the piano. But this Lily isn't human. It's a young, shiny Neoligo, which causes Gladion to get on the offensive until Lusamine 
Jean stops him. The father here says that his daughter Lily here gets shy, as it did get scared of the attack that Gladion almost unleashed on it. But later, as the kids look around the house for anything to explain or help in this situation, and Lily comes across some answers, the Ultra Beast Lily tries to attack her as Pikachu comes flying in with an iron tail to defend her after Ash and friends were in the same area and Pikachu picked up the familiar scent that led him to this house. Lusamine is an emotional wreck over her husband not remembering anything and that he thinks his daughter is an Ultra Beast, as then it tries to attack her, but Gladion comes in to save her. As it tries to run, Lily catches it in an embrace and thanks it for saving her father, as we learn that the Ultra Beast incident that at one point they believed killed their father didn't. Instead, the shiny Ultra Beast here found him in Ultra Space, bringing him back here to this world, just not to the right location, unbeknownst to the Ultra Beast. In connecting with him and seeing his memories, hearing him utter the name Lily and adapting that name if he mistakes it for her, the beast cloaked their look to seem like Lily to him, and then began growing an attachment to the man, not wanting to lose this feeling here and hiding any evidence to prove otherwise, taking down mirrors in the house so he couldn't see what he looks like to trigger any memories coming back, as Gladion hands him one to see himself for the first time in a long time. Everything comes rushing back and the illusion of this Ultra Beast being his daughter wears off, as he begins naming every member of his family when looking at them, with Lusamine crying tears of joy with them all sharing in a big hug. Before the small Ultra Beast leaves, Lily asks if it will stay with them. It saved their father, and in everyone's eyes, it's family, as they all hold up a beast ball together and capture it, ending on taking a photo of them as they all live together happily ever after. A nice, yet weird end to that storyline from the last generation. Then along with Ash, Go, and Chloe, everyone heads back to the Alola region for some more good vibes and reuniting, with Ash even getting to have a fun battle royale with Professor Kukui, Kiawe, and Gladion, with no result given about who wins. We even get a surprise hello from Tapu Koko again. Go even completes all of his Mew missions, making them eligible to be considered chasers for the project now. Ash heads home to Pallet Town for a bit of training, but he meets a familiar face there that we haven't seen in like four generations, and that's Paul, one of his old rivals. Ash's Infernape seems to have made full peace with Paul based on the issues of Paul abandoning the Pokemon back then, and Ash taking responsibility for training it from there. Paul comes back as a way of training for Ash, with them agreeing to battle, but he only wants to battle the Pokemon Ash is going to use in the top eight matches. Ash agrees to this and grabs his Pokemon for the match as they start. Ash sends out Lucario first, with Paul sending out Gyarados, with the two wasting no time trying to show their power in battle as Lucario comes out on top for the first round victory. They both send out their next Pokemon, with Ash using Dragonite and Paul using Garchomp. This match doesn't go quite the same as there is some good back and forth, but Garchomp is able to counter Dragonite's attacks and land a final Dragon Claw defeating Dragonite. Now for the last picks, Paul sends out Metagross, as Ash sends out Gengar, who thanks to its new Will-O-Wisp move, is able to defeat Metagross in the end with a Shadow Ball, making Ash the winner between them. Go takes note that the three Pokemon Paul chose for this battle each represent the main partner Pokemon from Steven Stone, Lance, and Cynthia, all as a way of potentially prepping Ash for what's to come. Paul also announces that he was offered to become a gym leader, only now being reassured of this thanks to a good battle with Ash. While Paul is still kind of a prick sometimes, it's good to see his growth going in a nice direction. But now we get to the big showcase, the Masters 8, as everyone begins arriving in the Gala region. Ash gets to have a little battle with Leon's little brother Hop, and he wins, but everyone else begins to arrive as Iris and Ash reunite again, with the others all showing up and meeting those that they haven't properly met yet. Alon has found himself a new ring and Mega Stone for his Charizard again, which is nice to see for him since we last left him in the XY era. The matchups to start things off have Leon facing Alon, Deantha facing Lance, Iris facing Cynthia, and Ash going up against Steven Stone. The battles start ripping through as Leon takes out Alon and his Mega Charizard X right off the bat, as Leon awaits facing Deantha in the semifinals after she ends up defeating Lance. Up next is Iris's battle with Cynthia, as this one offered the most spectacle thus far, as Iris gives it her all, but in the end, Cynthia takes the victory, with Ash sad for Iris as she ends up breaking down a bit, but she is still going to be rooting for Ash the whole time no matter what. And now it is time for Ash's big moment, his first battle is here, and he starts thanking everyone who helped get him to this point, taking position on the battlefield against Steven Stone as they get ready to begin. Steven starts off with his shiny Metagross, of course, with Ash using Dracovish as the two start going at it. Metagross, especially Steven's, is just too powerful, but Dracovish has a lot to offer in battle, causing quite the challenge for Metagross. Steven ends up swapping out to his Aggron instead, who is able to end things off with a heavy slam, taking out the Dracovish, as Ash doesn't get the first round victory, but that's okay, he's mentally prepared to stay focused in battle. He sends out Gengar, hitting it with a Will-O-Wisp right away, giving the Aggron a little burn. Thanks to this slowly draining the beast, Aggron eventually collapses later in battle and ends up defeated. Everyone 
everyone who is in Ash's life and watching right now is excited to see him doing well and get this knockout. From his friends in the seats of the stadium to Professor Oak along with all of his previous Pokemon watching back home. But the match isn't over yet as Steven sends out Cradilly as it non-stop hits Gengar with so many powerful attacks that it defeats it fairly quick, leaving Ash with only Pikachu left, which is a good thing in the moment, but first Pikachu has to defeat Cradilly, which he does with a flashy iron tail, but now it's good because Steven's last Pokemon is just his Metagross again, and Pikachu has defeated many a Metagross throughout his journey with Ash. So Pikachu gives it all he's got against the toughest Metagross battle he's had to face yet, especially once Steven Mega evolves it. So Ash and Pikachu sync up for their 10 million volt Thunderbolt attack that Pikachu has full control of its direction, avoiding Metagross's deflection of it, striking Metagross and winning the battle. Ash now is able to move on to the semi-finals and face off against Cynthia. Steven gives his compliments to Ash for a great battle as he believes Ash has what it takes to defeat Cynthia. Leon and Deantha begin their battle, making the start of the full six-on-six -six setup. Leon ends up defeating Deantha as the reigning champ now awaits for the final finalist to face him in the finals finally. Cynthia is ready to face Ash as she claims that after this whole event, she wants to retire from battling. Shocking to hear. But if that's the vibes, that's the vibes. The battle starts with Ash choosing Dragonite and Cynthia choosing Spiritomb. And Ash loses that first round victory with Spiritomb overpowering Dragonite and defeating it. With Ash choosing to send out Gengar as she swaps out for Roserade, as Gengar gets another Will-O-Wisp attack to hit, slowly burning the Roserade. With Cynthia re-swapping back to Spiritomb, making the matchup more spooky. But the ghost Pokemon battle results in Spiritomb taking down another of Ash's Pokemon, where Ash needs to really start picking up the pace here, or he's ghost, sorry, I mean toast. Pikachu comes out to face her newly swapped out Togekiss that Pikachu ends up starting to battle until she swaps out again, this time for a Gastrodon. We really need a swap limit, I swear. Pikachu though powers through to defeat Gastrodon, giving Ash more confidence in the match. She sends back out Spiritomb for the 900th time, as Pikachu holds up as best as he can to avoid all the tactics that worked on Ash's other Pokemon. Cynthia pulls a surprise though, having Spiritomb unleash its darker power going in and popping back out of its keystone, to now resemble this much larger show of force as it grabs Pikachu with Destiny Bond, forcing the remaining energy out of Pikachu and itself, resulting in a double knockout. Ash is feeling the heat, but he moves forward sending out Dragovish as Cynthia sends out Garchomp. She lets the Land Shark land some heavy hits before she swaps out again for her Roserade, who is still under the burn effect left on it. Dragovish uses this to its advantage, taking out the Roserade with some ease. Dragovish, while pretty hurt, wants to keep battling, sticking on her Milotic now as long as it can, delivering a few powerhouse hits that hurt the Pokemon, but Dragovish ends up gassed out and unable to battle. Ash uses Surfetch now as it pushes through Milotic's attacks to get in a powerful Meteor Assault, defeating the Serpent with Garchop coming back out now. While offering a valiant effort, Surfetch ends up defeated not long into their bout. Ash sends out his final Pokemon, Lucario, as Cynthia swaps her Garchomp out for her Togekiss, surprising Ash, who was waiting for her to Mega Evolve Garchomp, but instead Dynamaxes her Togekiss. Ash responds with Mega Evolving Lucario to make this a powerhouse fight, but thanks to Ash getting in sync with Lucario on an aura level again, Lucario sends out a massive aura sphere that nearly takes out Togekiss, with Cynthia really enjoying the match so far, even if her Togekiss goes down moments later thanks to Lucario. Garchomp comes back out now for the final part of the match, with the two Pokemon now going blow for blow, being swiftly fierce and incredibly tough, proving that they are both powerful individuals. Even when weak and nearly out of the battle, Lucario is able to launch a powerful counter to Garchomp, as they both knock each other to the sides and down, and Lucario uses whatever strength it has left to stand up, with Garchomp left unconscious on the ground, resulting in Ash winning the battle and earning the second spot in the finals to face Leon in the most important match of the competition. The battle was so good that Cynthia changes her mind about not wanting to battle anymore after this. She congratulates Ash on the battle and is blown away by how connected him and his Pokemon are. Before the final match takes place, we get a brief moment of downtime to recharge. Eternatus's Pokeball is no longer sealed away, and Go leaves the Pokemon under the care and watch of Leon, as Go has to leave himself, saying goodbye to Ash for however long he's going to be gone due to being called away for the Project Mew thing. They share a fist bump and are making sure that each other are following their dreams. Dawn ends up coming to watch the final match for Ash, which is just nice to see. But now Leon and Ash get ready for the biggest battle of the entire franchise ever. Ash is going to start things off with Pikachu while Leon chooses Cinderace, with at first things going in a more regular fashion of trading some blows back and forth, but both of them swap Pokemon fairly quickly as Ash sends out Gengar and Leon sends out Inteleon, with Ash choosing to use his extra ability up front, having Gengar Gigantamax, but this does result in Gengar defeating Inteleon, giving Ash his first first round victory of the finals. Leon starts getting more into the battle and it gets 
heated. Enjoying it more and more, the more challenging his opponent is. Leon now sends out his Mr. Rhyme, as Ash underestimates this silly little Pokemon a bit until it's able to change the terrain and finish off Gengar, and evening back up the match. Ash sends out his Surfetch next, but using it to fix the terrain advantage that Mr. Rain had set, switching back out to his Lucario, and oh boy is Lucario locked in for the fight, sensing all of Mr. Rhyme's movements to eventually then take it out. Leon brings out Dragapult next as Ash swaps to Dragovish, and Dragovish is able to provide quite the fight for Dragapult, even pulling out a secret bit of power when its spikes start glowing red, bringing forth this ancient energy that helps it really weaken Dragapult, but not fully knock it out, as its Dragon Tail attack forces Dragovich back into its Pokeball, with Dragonite coming out by force. But Ash is ready to strategize on the fly, having Dragonite grab onto Dragapult and slam it into the ground, and delivering direct attack moves right to it, taking Dragapult out. Next up, Leon chooses Rillaboom, who avenges Dragapult by taking out Dragonite, as Ash now sends out Surfetch once more. Rillaboom puts up with Surfetch for a tiny bit until it's had enough, slamming him into the ground and taking him out as well, leaving Ash in a more worrisome spot, but the battle's not over yet as he sends out Dragovish again who wants to get some payback for Surfetch being taken out, forcefully returning the powerful hits to Rillaboom knocking it out. Cinderace is sent back out as it gets to play on the field a bit with Dragovish, but then it swoops in and high jump kicks the mixed up fossil to nearly make it go extinct again, taking Dragovish out now as well. Ash sends out Pikachu as this is his last chance to beat Leon, and Leon swaps out to Charizard as he wants to make it a fun and easy yet exciting finisher, gigantamaxing the Charizard right away with Pikachu surviving what he can from the towering beast, opting to use his Z-move as they send in a 10 million volt Thunderbolt with Leon's Charizard using G-Max Wildfire, causing both attacks to connect together, resulting in a massive vortex forming as they both struggle and fight for power, fire versus electricity, going at it just as hard as the Pokemon themselves would. This power is activating something within Eternatus though, as the Galar particles are starting to react in a different way. This attack results in a massive burst of energy that fades away and showcases that Charizard is now back to his regular size and form, with Pikachu still okay. But from all the power of that energy, the clouds over the stadium have not gone away, making it seem like there might be another problem brewing. But Eternatus comes and makes an appearance for all to see. But in a surprising moment, Eternatus shoots his attack into the sky, ending the dark clouds above and reassuring everyone that this legendary Pokemon is now the protector of the region, as it leaves both Ash and Leon with a gift before it flies away, now having fully recharged the abilities for Dynamaxing or Gigantamaxing. So who are they to waste the gift, right? Break the rules, use more than one special in the battle, it's fine. Leon swaps out to his Cinderace again and chooses to Gigantamax it, while Ash does the same with Pikachu, as Pikachu uses the power it has to quickly take down the larger than life Fire Bunny, leaving Leon with only Charizard now, sending it back out as this is it, one Pokemon left each, and Pikachu is turned back to its regular size. Both trainers have loved the battle, truly believing to have given it their all so far. Ash makes it clear though, that from the moment that he met Pikachu, this is the moment that encapsulates everything they've done so far on their journey. It all comes together right here, right now. The two go all in for a while, not wasting any bit of energy. But later on, in a moment where Pikachu becomes dazed and falls over, leaving the crowd with bated breath, the screen cuts to black, as we hear the first words Ash ever said about Pikachu when he first saw him at Professor Oak's lab, leading us to a white void where Pikachu looks around to see every single Pokemon that Ash has ever captured cheering him on. Every single one from every generation, leading to Ash walking up to him to give him the power to get back up, as then we cut back to the match, with Pikachu going Super Saiyan, with the backing of the original Pokemon theme song backing up this incredible final bout between Pikachu and Charizard, as this all-out battle turns into the most satisfying, climactic moment in the history of Pokemon. Everything has built up to this moment, where you know Ash is finally going to win, and do so with Pikachu thanks to the love and friendship over this incredibly long journey, all with the music from your childhood making it more tear-jerkingly nostalgic than anything you've ever watched as the screen then cuts to black once more, with Pikachu now waking up to Ash above him happy to see him, as they are now at the Pokemon Center with him recovering from the battle. But don't worry, we cut right back to the results of the battle, as we see Charizard then falling over, with Ash receiving the title of Monarch now, and everyone around the world watching this happen live. Ash and Pikachu embrace in a hug of so much love and gratitude for everything that they've accomplished together to be here. Leon congratulates Ash on an incredible and fun battle, hoping to battle again someday, as Leon can go back to just being another challenger with no title to his name. At the end, Ash is awarded the trophy with his full team behind him in support, celebrating everything they've worked hard for. The next day, Ash is woken up to a phone call, hoping it's from Go with some news about Project Mew. We then jump a bit back as we go to the start of Go's journey for this particular Project Mew event, as we see him with Gary and the others going to Faraway Island, as they go 
go and officially search for Mew there. Their exciting adventure brings them into the middle of a Groudon and Kyogre event, as they all have to deal with these legendary Pokemon, but even after that, just seeing the sight of Rayquaza flying by, Go falls back into the ocean, only to be saved by none other than Mew, who drops him in again. Leading to this whole altercation with Mew and a bunch of other Pokemon that by the end of it all, Mew and Go become friends. Showing the others this as then the Project Mew team disbands, still open for a return on expeditions under their chaser jobs, if they want to do so. And thus leading up to the phone call of Go ringing Ash and explaining to him everything that just happened as then he asks and wants to hear all about this battle with Leon. Ash spends time going back to Pallet Town before he heads back to Vermilion City with Go as they both talk about the next steps in their paths, specifically taking them in different directions and wanting to go face these journeys on their own. This didn't go over so smoothly with how they discussed it and Go gets pretty emotional over it, but Chloe mentions to Ash that death just means he it was his first true friend he's ever made on his own journey. So even if he wants to go alone, it still hurts that Ash declared that he wanted to go alone in a less emotional way as well. Ash and Go end up working it out and easing up on the tension, seeing Pokemon in nature naturally evolving as they get an alert that pops up on their phone as a legendary Pokemon is about to appear, book ending their journey with Lugia making an appearance once more as they send out their Pokemon to try and battle it. But through trying to capture it and it failing, both of them start falling off a cliff that breaks apart, only to find themselves now on the back of Lugia and flying around, as Ho-Oh ends up flying alongside Lugia, making a meaningful moment for Ash happen to see Ho-Oh again as well. Later on, Chloe reveals that she is following in the footsteps of her father, working as a Pokemon researcher at the lab after all, but coming to this decision on her own. Go leaves all his Pokemon at the sanctuary that they built, and only holds on to Grookey, Inteleon, and of course, Cinderace. Ash and Go start leaving from the lab that they've been living in and part ways officially, with Go ending up at the Cerulean Gym meeting Misty, and Ash having a moment to reunite with his Butterfree that he let go all the way back in the original series when it found a mate with this pink Butterfree. Mimi is back at the house as well and places a group photo of everyone at the lab with all their Pokemon on the mantle, thus ending the third season of the show, and technically the final season in general? Oh, but wait, there's more? Well, you see, there is sort of this whole special episode and then 11 episode epilogue that add in the true end to Ash's Pokemon journey, so please join me in a special segment where I celebrate the journey I've been on with Pokemon my entire life, from the first day it aired on TV in the United States being September 8th, 1998, until right now on this day the final episode of Ash's journey premiering in the States on September 8th, 2023, 25 years later exactly. Who's that Pokemon? So real quick, before we get into everything, I just got back from Japan recently. I went through with my Pokemon podcast host from the Shadowless Podcast, The Real Breaking Nate and Super Duper Danny, as well as our friend Sarah Natacheni, aka the voice of Ash Ketchum, and stayed there for a while meeting up with our good friends Unlisted Leaf and Bear Walker. We went to a bunch of awesome places, did a lot of cool things, ate a lot of good food, and oh yeah, went to a little place called Pokemon World Championships 2023. And I just want to say thank you to the Pokemon company for providing me with a pass and my room accommodations. And since we were there, I thought it would be a lot of fun to sit down with Sarah Natacheni and talk a little Little bit about her experiences with the Pokemon anime now that the character that she's voiced for 17 years, Ash Ketchum, has come to an end. Where did your passion for voice acting truly kick in? I think it was when I had to make my first reel, actually. I, um, I booked Pokemon when I was 18 years old and I didn't, I was like freelancing with my current agency at that point, but I, I wasn't with them like seriously, seriously. I hadn't like had a meeting with the whole place and and gotten approval from everybody and, you know, started on my journey with them. So I, uh, I set out to make a reel on my own and I was like, all right, what are all the accents I can do? What all the, you know, what's my range, like my vocal range and what are the characters that I can truly play? And I made a grid, like a, like a, you know, like a spreadsheet of all of those things and I mixed and matched everything and I was like, okay, I'm going to make this character have a German accent and da 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 da. So um, I think that's where the passion really kicked in when I when I realized how many different things I could do and that I could play characters that I don't look like. How did it feel getting cast in the role of Ash Ketchum at a young age? Amazing. Um, I auditioned for it when I was 18 years old and um, I already knew how big the show was and it was incredibly exciting. I didn't know anybody in voice acting at that point. I didn't know I, I, didn't know I wanted to be a voice actor. I was just doing on camera and theater and you know, high school at that point. So um, uh, I was very, very excited and nervous because it's such a big job to get right out the gate um, when you're starting your career. It's like one of the biggest things in the world and here I am like, hi. 
So, um, it was awesome. What aspect about voicing the main character in the Pokemon anime means the most to you? The fans. I, I only started doing conventions, like, in earnest about a year and a half ago, and seeing how much the character has inspired them to be the very best like no one ever was. And, um, seeing how much Pokemon itself has gotten them through hard times and, you know, kind of offered an escape to, to life when things are getting tough. Knowing that I'm a big part of that has um, been very, very good for me mentally and um, emotionally and artistically too, because I know that this work is reaching people on, you know, in their soul. So I'm really proud of the work we've done. I love the fact that we're all experiencing the end of an era together in a safe way. Um, life comes with so many changes and so many endings and so many beginnings and I think um, an animated show uh, that's that's for everyone but especially for children um, doing that is 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 a wonderful thing it's a wonderful lesson to teach us all and it's a wonderful thing that we all get to go through it together in this kind of safe and communal way <laughs> We start off in these extra episodes to sunset Ash under the banner of To Be A Pokemon Master, starting with Ash coming to a crossroads while journeying alone, tossing a stick into the air to determine which direction he heads in when it lands. But after it chooses for him, he decides to take the opposite. Ash and Pikachu are just having fun in nature, exploring the area and living life by however it comes, especially when Team Rocket comes around and he can easily take care of them. When blasting off, they end up bumping into something that was invisible, launching them away and sending the Pokemon down into the trees below, as Ash looks back to see the invisible Pokemon become visible again, making him happy to see a Latias, and rushing over to help it, having his Pokemon help and jump in as well. In the downtime of Latias not doing so well, Ash spends time with it, healing up its wounds, falling asleep next to it. It wakes up before Ash does and freaks out over seeing him, and all the other Pokemon, taking off quickly as Ash then wakes up and says he just wants to help her, and that she hasn't fully recovered yet. Team Rocket comes back around to capture the Latias as Ash quickly quickly jumps in to help where it finally trusts Ash now. Once back in safety, the Latias hides itself again, becoming invisible, while Ash wants to see her again, hopefully one day, as this Latias now watches over him. Later on, Ash is fishing, hanging out with his other Pokemon, as Misty comes around congratulating him for winning and becoming the world champion. She tells Ash that she was so inspired by it all that she wants to set out on her own journey again, giving the gym back to her sisters for now. Both Ash and Misty playfully fight over who wants to capture this pesky clauncher more, as they get get into a battle over it, with Ash sending out Corefish and Misty sending out her Politoed. The battle is fun and it shows off the different trainer skills in a smaller one-on-one -on -one setting, as Politoed ends up defeating Corefish with Misty capturing the Clauncher as per the deal. After hanging out for a while, Ash starts heading out as him and Pikachu notice that Misty is trying to follow them, with her coming out to say that she would like to join Ash on some travels for a bit, with Ash pretending not to want that, but Pikachu saves her from feeling awkward and gives her the signal that Ash of course would love that. Their travels take them back to the Galar region where they run into some more familiar faces, Brock and Silen, as it's nice to see them both, but Silen returns back to the Unova region after spending some time with the group as Brock wants to come along with Ash and Misty again like old times, as the other two are excited for more of his cooking. These random travels so far just showcase some fun moments that the group get to have again, as Ash just ends up helping a sad bear tick train and learn to control its powers and help it live a nice life being dubbed the Ice Master in its environment. Eventually, the group are back in Vermilion City, where they get surprised seeing an ad showing a Squirtle firefighting squad show and noticing that it is in fact his Squirtle and his Squirtle squad pal starring in it. Squirtle gets excited to see his friends coming to support him, but thanks to Team Rocket getting involved and forcing a gap between Squirtle and them, a big misunderstanding causes Squirtle to think that his friends don't care about him. But more important than a manipulated feud is a fire breaking out, causing the Squirtle squad to shed their Hollywood vibes and become actual heroes again. With Charizard and Bulbasaur doing what they can to also help, and in the end, Squirtle and Ash make up, proving that their friendship is stronger than ever, and it was great to spend some time together as they continue on their separate ways from there. Ash later on comes across his Lapras from back in the Orange Island days, excited to see it again as they ride on Lapras after all this time, with Lapras needing some help with something, as it then brings him to where it needs this help, as we find out that it's over a Whalmer who became stuck. 
So after a bunch of funny and not working ways to free this circular whale, they eventually are able to get it unstuck when it becomes so happy it evolves into a whale lord and becomes stuck again. Don't worry, it becomes free again. Ash and the gang get dropped off by the Lapras at the end of everything as they say their goodbyes, watching the majestic water taxi swim back off with its own horde of Lapras. Or Lapri. L -lap Lapracy. Later on, Ash finally gets Latias to reveal itself, leading to some mystery that it may need help with, showing a Latios escaping from being captive and getting away, causing the Latias to worry heavily over this. Team Rocket gets to have their own reunion of all their Pokemon, which is cool to see, but what's not cool to see is that Jesse, James, and Meowth end up blaming each other over their failures, and they end up deciding to part ways, breaking up the group officially now, even individually going to Team Rocket headquarters and requesting their own solo Team Rocket careers. Latias leads them to where the Latios is being held captive, and Ash gets involved in help saving the day from this Pokemon hunter who was responsible for this, reuniting the Latios and the Latias, as they all head home and fly past a familiar Bianca from the Heroes movie. After this, Ash decides to head back home for now, and for the final episode of the entire series, Ash says goodbye to Misty and Brock after getting a little bit of time to travel with them once more. At home, Ash is shown to live a normal kid life and over dinner, tells his mother all about the travels he had with Misty and Brock again. Even later on in bed, Ash is still thinking about stuff from his adventures, wondering about Latias and Latios and hoping that they're doing well. The next day, he rushes over to Professor Oak's lab, getting to see Tracy again, and being excited to see a new batch of the three original starters being brought in, as the Charmander needs some help as it fell down to a small cave. And of course, Ash tries to rescue it, with Gary coming to lend a hand, as he's the one that brought them over to the lab in the first place. Gary and Ash get to catch up a bit as Gary asks what's next for Ash. How much closer is he to becoming a Pokemon master, as Ash lays silent and thought about this. Gary heads out and says goodbye, but this is all Ash can think about now. What is next? What does it mean to be a Pokemon master? Ash ends in a day-by-day -day funk, starting to feel directionless now, as in the meantime, Team Rocket ends up coming back together as friends again, and starting their trio back up, or for at least of the reasons to get out of working for the cafeteria at the Team Rocket headquarters. They come across a sad Ash Ketchum and take advantage of going after his Pikachu, with Ash having no Pokemon on him to help out. But then his old Pidgeot that he sent free in the original series comes back and helps rescue Pikachu for him, and now joins back on Ash's team for old times' sake. A new day starts in Pallet Town as Ash heads out, still thinking on what Gary said as he knows becoming a world champion wasn't the end-all be-all goal, and his adventures with people and Pokemon friends alike are what make it special. They're what make the journey so great. So to get to actually living this Pokemon master life, he wants to go out into the world more and more and befriend every Pokemon there is. A bright rainbow forms in the sky after the rain stops and Ash looks to Pikachu to be by his side while they head to become a Pokemon master. The next morning, Ash is already up and headed out of the house with his new pair of shoes, coming to a crossroads once more with Pikachu handing him a stick, and he throws up into the air to pick a direction, and when it lands on the ground, we see that the story of Ash Ketchum has officially come to an end, and it's beautifully done. There is one extra special that came out as well, where Ash is out with Pikachu like usual, as his mother tells him she is meeting his father in town with Ash getting excited and wanting to go see his father that he hasn't seen in a very long time. Nor have we. Ever. In fact, this is like the first mention of it. Like, I feel like this confirms a lot of things. Along his way to town at one point, Ash comes across this kid named Sunny, who wants to learn about Pokemon, but he's never even had the chance to hold one or pet one. So Ash ends up playing a bit of a babysitter and a mentor figure role all at once, even being shown some Mankey by this kid at one point, as one of them has his favorite hat, reminding him of when a Mankey stole his hat back in the OG series. Ash goes to get it back for him, as it ultimately comes down to the kid's hat or his hat, choosing to give his own for the kids, and as he brings it back to the kid, the kid just keeps moving away every time he tries to hand it to him. This all leads us to the kid's parents' house as they notice the hat in Ash's hand and ask him where he got that, as he says that Sonny asked him to get it for him, as his father then calls him a liar, while the mother starts breaking down in tears. Learning more about this, the grieving parents explain that their son Sonny became very sick a year ago and passed away, making Ash think about the kid the whole time not being able to touch Pokemon, or eat food, or even grab the hat. It was because he couldn't. We get to experience the parents discuss how they deal with grief, as well as see the world now after their whole world passed away. 
It truly gets pretty deep and introspective here in a way that feels so unlike Pokemon, because in the past, they tell you all of this with stuff like a Litten dealing with a Stoutland dying, not a human set of parents grieving over their kid who passed away. So it's definitely a different type of tone here. After Ash leaves, Ash runs into the ghost of Sunny again, offering him to pet Pikachu as the ghost kid reaches his arm out, but it faces right through Pikachu, not feeling anything. Ash comes up with a way for this to work, using his aura to translate the feeling of touching Pikachu to him. Sunny is grateful and can experience this, but when Ash opens his eyes, the kid is gone, symbolizing a task left in this world for a wandering spirit to complete before peacefully passing on. Ash sits under a tree with Pikachu for a moment, taking in and saying how grateful he is for Pikachu to be in his life, not taking these moments and feelings for granted. Ash finally makes it to town, excited to see his father, but is met with much disappointment when he had already left before he got there due to some emergency coming up. But he did leave Ash a gift. Poetically, the gift is a brand new hat. He needed a new one anyway, but this isn't just any hat, it's the OG hat. Later on, Ash ends up crying, but he doesn't know why. He just feels sad for some reason. But as the next day comes around, Ash hears the reports of an Entei being in the area, as he then rushes out into the world for more adventures under the distant blue sky. You know, because that's the title of this episode. And wow, what an emotional and interesting way to sunset Ash Ketchum. I am severely moved by just how enjoyable, relaxed, and emotional these handful of final episodes are, and I love that Ash's future is ambiguous. There is no finality. He just continues having journeys as he works to become a Pokemon master, and also leaving the ambiguity in the air towards Ash's father. Is Ash's father alive? Is Ash's father dead? What is he perceiving as grief? Or what do his emotions truly mean? I think there's a lot to it, all done in a beautiful way, that makes you feel like you got somewhere by the end of it all, even if a lot of the things are left unanswered. I also want to say I like that throughout the episodes, Ash's team of Pokemon constantly changes, giving us a showcase of some fan favorites and just a bunch of cool Pokemon that Ash has got over his whole 25 years of catching him. But for Ash's journey, I guess that's the end of the guide. With Ash now becoming world champion, having some time to figure out himself, meeting back with some old friends, finishing some major payoffs for long-term fans of the show, and charting the future for his journey to now continue off-screen as it officially has ended for us. So I guess overall, this is the official goodbye to Ash Ketchum, and I hope you've had a good time with this complete guide to Ash's Pokemon journey. I've been Jordan Fringe, thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe, later.